it says here, modern science is quick to explain away all reports of it as simply vivid dreams. But those who say they've had spooky, amorous encounters say they're not making it up. Yeah. Indeed, in some cases, women claim they enjoy sex with spirits so much they have given up on real men. But so these women you've are had clearly, it, Mike. These women are clearly deranged. You've had it, MG. They? You have had it. What do you mean I've had it? You're creeping well, around I, the actually, edges I there. Have, I have had it. You, you, you haven't had it for you, a, you, even the best part of this century, you, have you? You, you creep around the edges there, trying to, you know, persuade women to get lecherous with you. Your days could be over, mate, if these women suddenly find that there's a spook out there really? who's ten times better than you. This is Talk Sport. We are the two Mikes, and I'm delighted to say it's time to say a very good morning to Mr. Mike, a porky, a parry. A very good morning to you, Mr. Parry. A uh, very good morning to you, Mike, and uh, creeping closer to the day of reverence. Well, when you say creeping, it gives yes. a bad image, I think. It's not so not much creeping, creeping. it's I, kind I, of edging, perhaps. Edging. edging, I like edging, or with stealth. With stealth. With stealth getting towards yeah. uh, Christmas Day, because it's my favourite day of the year, Christmas Is it really? Day, without a shadow yeah. of a doubt. It's not getting any colder, though, unfortunately, is it? No, I wish it was a bit colder. I hate mm. a, a mild Christmas day. I like a Christmas day to be a day when you're peering out of the window... Yeah. And the snow is falling. Well, no, that's that, that is beyond the imagination in this country. Yeah. I've never seen snow falling. But what I love, I remember mm. one year peering out of the window, yeah. and there was a robin redbreast on the window sill oh, outside, really? almost like a picture postcard. Uh, absolutely, and yeah. I thought, what a, it, you know, it's like, almost like a message from you know, the spiritual Almighty. message. Yeah, a message from the Almighty. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That well, you know, there's thing. a massive storm coming, particularly to large parts of the north of England and possibly to Scotland as well. Well, we were in that part of the world last week, yeah. and it was incredibly. Mild. Mild. Mm. I didn't even take a coat to Glasgow when no. we went there last week. No, I didn't was, need one. It was ridiculously mild. I, d- I didn't even need one. But I'm told now that for a line from about sort of Hull mm. to about sort of Carlisle yeah. uh, and North... And North. ...is going to well, be so bad news really over a, Christmas. Well, so it's not really a line from Hull and Carlisle. Do you mean a, a, vert- a horizontal line moving, eh? moving upwards, do you mean? Yeah, no, I mean in a line above yeah. that, above oh, that, see. above right. that. Uh, it's, it's, it's not going to be uh, not going to so be. So they might news. get a bit of snow up there. Uh, might get a bit of snow up there. That's mm. right. Yeah. What do you think about the Lou Carcou Very story? Exciting. Well, I mean, I'm not that Can interested. I, if really. Lou, Lou, I'm not really Lou that interested in Lou Carcou. Lou no. Carcou is a very, very average player who occasionally does very well. Yeah, that's well, that's my opinion. Okay. Of Lou well, I, I, I will ignore that because it, well, it's just you're just trying to provoke me. I'm into, not trying to provoke into, you. Into, into, I'm not trying to provoke you. Listen, if I thought Lou Carcou was a great player, I would say so. But he's not a great player. Great players do not have long periods of, of absence from scoring goals. Uh, they don't. Sorry, and his long period of absence from scoring has, goals is. Well, I'm not talking about his current p- period of not scoring no, goals. No, because there isn't one. No, but he has. But he has scored a couple of goals recently. But he is yeah. very inconsistent yeah. goal scorer. He's a very inconsistent player. Mm. He can knock a hat trick in one well, week, and then the next week he hardly touches the ball. Or one week he yeah. can play with the touch of Lionel Messi, mm. and the next week every yeah. time the ball hits him, it bounces off into the stands. But all I can say is because it, it, it is quite a surprise to hear that. Um, Romelu Lukaku, and this is through his agent, by the way. Yeah. His agent's usually the people who manipulate the, you know, the. And his agent is interested, like all story. agents, in, like all agents, in getting the most that he of can get he for his player. Of course okay? he is. So I know you're going to say to me that you know yeah. clearly Lukaku thinks there's something big happening at Everton. That's right. But in fact, what's happened is that the agent has managed to secure a very good deal for him for a yeah. new contract. So he's going to go for it. Yeah, no, no, not that. Lukaku is a man who is is driven by ambition. He won't stay at a club where he thinks he's going to be a part-time player in terms of the best strikers in the league yeah. for the rest of his life. He mm. won't do that. He wants to be a number one striker and that's what he's going to be. There must be a plan at Everton that we don't even know about yet to rebuild the club and it's going to be rebuilt about, uh, around Romelu Lukaku. Isn't it I'm possible? sure that I'm sure that that's a possibility. Yeah, it's a possibility. I have no inside information. Right. But I mean if you know if somebody at Everton's gone to him and said look Romelu we want you to stay because frankly uh, you know, the time for me, I'm thinking now of Mr. Cooman. the time for me to assess what needs to be done here is over. In the second half of this season, we're going to make strides to um, move towards a well, position where we'll, we'll have a Premier League uh, challenging team, uh, Premier League Championship challenging team next season. You are going to be, he said, I'm going to get a piece of white paper, I'm going to write your name on it. Lou, Lou, Lou Carcou, yeah. and then I'm going to write everybody else's name on after that. Yeah, OK. Well, do you know that the agent who was speaking to Talksport a bit earlier, Mino Raylo, uh, said that the new contract will not prevent him leaving at the end of the season, mm. right? His current deal expires so in 2019. So who's this guy? Then, well, this is Lukaku's agent. Yeah. His name is Mino Raiola. Yeah. Right? 
Uh, his, I he's think he's got more than one agent. Uh, well, you say no, that do, he's, not, he's not the right guy. Well, I, I, you know, I can't say too much here, but I mean, these people... With Everton, we have a 99.9% of terms, right? Mm-hmm. We are talking to the club in a good spirit, so we are very hopeful. There are yes. no problems on the way that I foresee. However, this is not also possible that there are no other offers from any other clubs. Lukaku's made no secret of the fact that he'd like to play for, in his words, a bigger team mm. and get himself into the Champions League. No, they're League. not his words. Uh, he said he wanted to play for a team that was in the Champions League. That's right. Well, so that's by definition a bigger team. Team, no, it's not. It? It's not. Why isn't it? Are Leicester City a bigger team than Everton? Well, they are within the Champions League. Yeah. Well, that's on a temporary. It may not basis. be a bigger club. On a temporary basis. It may not man. be a bigger club, but they're you, a bigger would you, team. Would you say that uh, Porto are a bigger club than Everton? That's a different question. You didn't say bigger team. Bigger team or bigger club? No bigger club. A bigger club? No, I wouldn't. No, well, they. But go. they are a bigger team because they're in the Champions League. Yeah. Well, that's the I, point. I dispute that because well, there, there are plenty of also run you know, teams in the have, Champions League have from. You can have all these conversations like Nottingham Forest yeah, uh, yeah. fans have, like Newcastle United fans have, you know, mm. like all these teams, mm. like Leeds United fans have, yes. and Rangers have, that these are a bigger club than yes. any club that's ever existed mm. now and in the future. The point is is that in the team, the team world, mm. right, if your team is in the Champions League, then it's bigger than if your team is not in the Champions League, surely? No, because I think you'll find some very weak teams starting the Champions League from lesser European leagues. Yes, they do, but, you know, they're still the... In the, but if they're in the final stages of it and they've yeah. come out of the group stages, yeah. they're still in it. That's some French teams that get into the Champions League, I mean, they'd barely get into the yeah, championship let's, in this, let's, in this let's, country. Let's, let's talk about the ones that are in the actual you yeah. know, final 16. But anyway, let's have a listen to what Rola said when he was on Talk Sport. Let's say 90%, 99.9% reached terms. And uh, yeah, if then Romulu is good enough and strong enough to move on in the next years, then we will talk to Everton about it. In, in a, it's a very good relationship at the moment. So uh, we know what both parties want. We, want. we know what the future is. But uh, for now, we are agreeing terms. And then we see in the summer what happens. But at this point, we only have one objective, and that is to, to perform as well as possible in Everton. No, so it sounds to me like he's staying as long as he gets more money, and then he's off. No, uh, the crucial word there mm. was the word years. Yeah. He didn't say year in the next year. He yeah. didn't say because because you misled me earlier on. You said, "Oh yes," but I heard him say that next year he could be off. Well, he could no, be. No, he said in the next years, mm. plural. Well, so it says clearly here, there's a plan underway here. It, it does not prevent him leaving at the end of the season. I it's think I'm reading Everton the situation deal. very well. His current Everton deal expires in 2019. Are you telling me, for example, given yes. what Everton have done in the past mm. with their other very valuable? players, yes. because as you've said before, mm. nothing against Everton, every club is a selling club, right? Yes. If Real Madrid thought that uh, Romelu Lukaku was going to be the next Ronaldo, yes. and they offered uh, um, Everton £75 million, yes. are you telling me they wouldn't sell him? Of course they would. I don't know whether they would or not. They I would. I don't know whether Everton have a financial plan in place in which they can resist offers of £75 million. By the way, aren't Everton starting to look like genius businessmen no. in, the sa- in, hang on, in the sale of John Stones? John Stones is shortly going to be eased out of the Manchester City defence right. full-time, isn't he? He is. It right? seemed that way. And, Despite and, the fact that you said that he was going to be the greatest uh, centre-back England had ever seen. If he'd have stayed at Everton, he would have been. No, he wouldn't. I'm sorry, he would have no. been. He's been destroyed by the expectations heaped upon his shoulders at Manchester City. Was and, he not destroyed by Roberto Martinez, uh, first no, off, then? No, no, and, he's in a, and, and the inability of anybody to sort of, you know put the hand on his shoulder and say, look, this is a gradual development. You don't have to become brilliant overnight. Yeah. You see, Everton are good at this because, remember old Jack, what's his name? We sold to Manchester City as well. He disappeared into yeah. the sort of grey mist of yes. premiership injury list yeah. and then surfaced at Sunderland. Yeah. I mean, and they, these guys are worth a maximum premium price when Everton get rid of them and they just disappeared downhill, mm. you see? Well, maybe what Everton are very good mm. at is making players who are very average look good in their team because the rest of the players aren't very good either. Well, no, I don't think it's that. And I'm not going to take offence at that, even though you're trying to offend me. I'm not me. trying to offend what, you. What it is, what it is, is... I'm is, just trying to look at it in, with, with, in a cool light of day without your obvious if, love for the club and, no. and your in, in, inherent bias, which is not un, unexpected. There's nothing wrong with it. No, if you, if you are a star at Everton, and I accept that Everton um, are not widely recognised as a potential top four club at the moment, but if you're a star there, like uh, John Stones you get special treatment because you are the jewel, if you see what I mean. And, mm. and, 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 and you're worth a lot, obviously, as a valuable player, but you're, you're, you're tremendously important in the pivotal structure of the team. When you go to Manchester City, 
everybody there is supposed to be a superstar, mm. so you don't get the individual sort of Indeed. attention from the staff of the club that you might have done at Everton, and then I think things change. Yes, indeed, absolutely yeah. right. Now, we've got lots to talk about tonight. We're going to talk to John Krieger, our man over in the United States of America, because there's some very interesting developments in the world of Formula One. Yes. Uh, now that John Malone from Liberty Media has bought the whole business. Now, he's interesting, isn't he? Because when we used to work in America, yeah. there was a massive um, sort of media battle going on all the time between yeah. Rupert Murdoch and That's John right. Malone. That's right. And do you remember, I think at one stage, Mr Murdoch owned Direct TV, yes. which was the pay-per-view, mm, mm. and I think he had to, or not had to, but I think he offloaded that to John Malone yeah. in order to raise the funds yes. to buy another business yeah. and all that kind of stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? And one of the big head, head honchos who's going to be running Formula One, funnily enough, working for John Malone, is an ex-honcho of the Rupert Murdoch organisation. So is that it's, right? all, it's all very yeah. fascinating stuff. We'll be dealing, giving you more of that. We'll yeah. be talking to America's top dating expert as well. I like which that. should be fascinating. This is good. And of course, it's Porky Vision as well, uh, where Carry On you Camel, or whatever lonely. this movie is called. This, oh, it's, it, was, uh, it was a great film. It's, it's, I watched it this afternoon. All right. OK, well, don't I, tell us too I, much now. Brilliant, brilliant. Right, okay. There are other things I will tell you well, about that's in Porky Vision. There are lots yeah. of other things going on. We're getting very close to Christmas. This is Talk Sport. Talk Sport, we are the two mics, loads coming up, of course, including uh, the latest on the Formula One uh, situation, which is getting very, very uh, tasty indeed. Sean in Tranmere says, evening, lads. Classic nonsense from Porky. Of course, Porto are a bigger club. They've won two European Cups. How many have Everton won? Plank. Well, again, I mean, that doesn't necessarily no, mean doesn't. that one club is bigger because it's one oh, European Cup. Oh, Nottingham Forest are a bigger club than Everton. Well, I don't know whether they are, but Nottingham they Forest They've won two fans, European Cups. Yeah, but this is what I'm saying. I mean, yes. the, the, this, this argument goes on constantly and, and often yeah. rears its head on talk sport. Yeah. And people say, well, you know, well, of course, such and such a club is bigger than this other yes. club. I don't think that matters, really. What difference no, does it make no, no. whether your club is bigger than another? Well... You know, it's like saying my dad's bigger than yours. Yeah, could be right. Who cares? Here's one from uh, uh, mm. Ethan, mm. Uh, who says, Stones just needs to focus on being a defender. Get the ball out of danger space and mm. not dribble it around. Well, I thought that uh, Pep Guardiola was the guy that liked players dribbling yeah, the ball exactly. around. Exactly. But there we are. That one's uh, been going on for a bit. Listen, there's a, there's a story I think we must focus on later yes. on in the show. Yeah. As a, as a matter of principle, really. Yeah. And it's the it's the situation involving the stunt firm boss, you know, who... Has, the which firm boss? The stunt firm oh, boss. Oh, yes. He's been fined £100,000 mm. because... Uh, you know, in a horrendous case, yeah. which we must look at later, yeah. because then this could set a precedent mm. for all sort of relationships between employees and yeah. employers. Right. He um, he put his human cannonball bloke into the cannon, yeah. fired it. Yeah. There was no safety net. What, do you mean nothing for him to land No, in? no. Well, you can't do that. How well, can you have a human cannonball that does have a net to I land in? I don't know. So I don't know. Land it, then? Um, he landed like on the side of a house or something. You know, it's really bad news for all uh, human cannonballs in the future if, yeah. if, if you don't clamp down on people well, how who... How can you not have a net? Well, I don't know. Isn't I... that the whole point of being a human cannonball is they fire you out? And then you go through the air, yeah. and everybody's going, ooh, oh, isn't that amazing? That, that's right. What a brave man. And then that's you right. land in a net. Well, he did land in the net, ah. but unfortunately the net collapsed. Oh, I see. The net and, wasn't and, and, of, of and so bang, strength. You know, it was, right. uh, you know, head first into yeah, the... Yeah, because, uh, I mean, you'd have to be pretty stupid ground. to be yeah. a human cannibal to agree to be fired out without a net. Yes, that's right, yeah. yeah. Um, and, and, and I'm actually, not sure what, what this means for other employers, though. Other well, than those I, who fire I think in health cannons. and safety, this yeah. is the uh, this is the ultimate health and safety yeah. issue, isn't it? It is. If you if you um, train to be a human cannonball, yeah. you get into the cannon, mm. and you you can imagine you're in the cannon with your hands at your side, yeah. you've got your helmet on, yeah. and you just wait for that what bang. When the bang goes, by the way, yeah. do your feet not sort of get incredibly roasted or something? No, because How it's, does that it's work? no, no, it's not an explosion. It's a spring. Yeah, it's a spring, liter- literally. So they just let the spring go. And uh-huh. boof, it, 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 it uh, catapults oh, so it's you. it's like a catapult. Yes, yeah. it's not... It's, it's, there's no... I've uh, never really understood that. No, there's, uh, believe me, there's no uh, There's no gunpowder involved or yeah. anything like that. It's not like... Well, there must be gunpowder to make the explosion that makes the spring shoot out, no? No, 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 no. The spring is just released. It, 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 they wind the spring back. Right. You see what I mean? Right. You know, in the, in the well, way... So it's not a real cannon, then? Well, it it looks like a cannon, right. but it doesn't have... Uh, you know, like... Well, isn't that the point, though? Don't they make an explosion-like sound so that it sounds like... What they do is they get pyrotechnics around yeah. the base of the cannon, yeah. pyrotechnics right. being like fireworks and I things. I know what pyrotechnics yeah, are. Yeah, so they make, it, they make it sound and... pyromaniac. Yes, exactly. They make it sound and look like um, he's been That's fired out of the cannon, for, you know, in the same way that a cannonball is fired out of the cannon on mm. board HMS Victory. Yes. 
Um, you know what I mean? So is a cannonball just catapulted out as well, then? No, no, no. A cannonball is blown out by right. gunpowder behind it. Yeah. I mean, you've seen the films, haven't you, where the, the, on, the, on the deck of the burning ship, mm. they first of all put the charge down in the yeah. cannon, then and they, they get the, the rod. Fuse. Yeah, that's right. They get the rod yeah. and they pack it in. Yeah. Then they put the cannonball in right. and they light the fuse and bang, it blows the cannonball out. Well, that's what I assumed they did with human cannons. No, 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 no. Quite seriously, what they do... You know, you know, um, you know, if you could take your car apart, which, yeah. of course, you wouldn't want to, no. but a nice car it is, yeah. the, the springs on your wheels, yes. the shock absorbers, yes. are a compressed spring. You've uh-huh. seen that, yes. haven't you? You've yeah. seen it right. Well, that's exactly what it is. OK. But they pull it right back and mm. then they release it, bang, and, and, and the guy goes. No, right, OK. He lands in his net... But then, unfortunately, very unfortunately for the, the cannonball uh, guy, mm. uh, it collapsed. And uh, as a result, um, you know, it became a fatality. It was a shocking case. That's awful, isn't it? Yeah, shocking case. Um, and so the, uh, the guy who owns it has been fined £100,000. Mm. Um, has he found himself another human cannonball since? Well, I don't know about that. The, the, uh, the poor chap who was the victim, I mean, obviously, you know... It's brown bread, yeah. and uh, it's a tragic case. But what I'm saying is, is, if ever there's an illustration of how we have to, at all costs, be entirely supportive yeah. of health and safety rules at work, yeah. that's got to be the perfect example. I would, I would say so, yeah. Mm. I would say so. But it must be a nightmare if you are a health and safety official trying to actually officiate yeah. in these yeah. kinds of situations. Sure. But, uh, but it's well, well worth bringing to you. Do you think we should ban it? No. I'm no, I don't either. No, I'm not in favour of banning no, things. No, I, I agree. I'm not a banner no, either. No, you are. You always want to ban things. No, I don't. What do I want to well, ban? Well, I, I would say this year you wanted to ban... Uh, let's see. What did you want to ban? You want to ban rucksacks? You want to ban flip-flops? Well, well rucksackers are, ban... are antisocial people. Yeah, in fact, I came across you did a guy to today... Them, didn't you? came across a guy today who was standing in the doorway of a tube train, mm. right? But because he was waiting for his mate or his partner... Yeah. He was sort of holding the door. Yeah. You see what I mean? Right. But he was Very actually he was actually covering the whole space mm. because he was a big fat individual anyway. Yeah. He had a he had a rucksack on his back yeah. and he covered the whole of the entrance to the the train. Mm. And I literally pushed him and Did said, you? "You get out the way." Right. You know, there was no niceties <laughs> about it because this man was being antisocial. Yeah. A holding up the train mm. and B preventing anybody getting yeah. on in the last second before the train was due to go. Right. And, and they, they're so antisocial. They are, I mean, they are, particularly on the tube, actually. Yeah. They're particularly Rock large. Rucksackers are, are ignorant. And you'd like to ban them, wouldn't you? If, if, uh, well, all I'm saying is, I, I haven't said that. What I've said is, I think they should. I, no, I haven't. I, I said they can certainly use public transport, but they should pay double fare mm. because they take up double the space, uh-huh. literally. Yeah, OK. How about this from Derek in yeah. Pitcoid? Oh, uh, the says, bunk Mike, cleaner. Porky claims that when players leave Everton, they go downhill. Mm. Rooney didn't. That's a good point. No, I didn't say all players who leave Everton go downhill, but very, very few of them go on to greater things yeah. because Everton have been a major club for so long. I mean, Alan Ball left, uh, left Everton, yeah. believe it or not, when he fell out with Harry Capsule. What about the Mikel Arteta when he went, he, to went to a, he went to Arsenal? He went to Arsenal, he went downhill. Mikel Arteta went to Arsenal, he did all right there. He didn't win anything, did he? Um, did he win didn't a one win FA Cup? One FA Cup, maybe. Yeah, I think that's about well, it. Oh, yeah, but yeah. he would have played in the Champions League and all the rest of it, you know. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's a I mean, bit you average. can't poo poo being in the Champions League because that is where you would want Everton to be. You would want Everton to be in the top four. Totally agree. You'd want them in the Champions League. Totally agree. I have no, I have no contradiction to your statement there whatsoever. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Now, I've got to talk to you as well about yeah. Mercedes because uh, yeah. a couple of people have drawn this to my attention. You know the Volkswagen uh, emissions scandal of yes. earlier this year? Yes. Well, it turns out Mercedes have been up to something very similar, which I will give you details on coming up in a little while. I know nothing about it. turns this. out about a C class and an E class. You know, the miles uh, per gallon that they do yeah. are completely and utterly wrong. Uh, things, stuff I about... get very good mileage out of mine. Well, you don't get what the manufacturer says you get. I roar up and down the A3. And uh, I get uh, terrifically good uh, mileage out of it because I, ex- you know, I, I, I almost uh, exceed to the speed limit. You almost uh, exceed yeah, to the speed yeah, limit. What does that yeah. mean? Well, you're allowed to do seventy two or seventy three. You told without... us you drove at eighty miles an hour. Last well, week. I do sometimes when I believe the road um, surface to be uh, clean, uh-huh. safe, uh, the light to be good, uh, the weather conditions to be perfect for driving. Yeah. Uh, I do think there's a case to raise the speed limit to 80 miles an hour, and I sometimes test mm. that. I test that in order to gather the evidence and the information to be able to pursue that argument with the authorities. Yes, I'm very well aware of that. Uh, however, there are figures which I will reveal to you later on tonight uh, which show that Mercedes have been at it, which is not a good thing. I, I, I dispute that, and I think we should be very careful about accusing uh, people with uh, huge brand names um, that they're at it. Well, I mean, that is the allegation. Yes. 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 Because would you agree that Volkswagen, for example, were at it? 
Uh, I don't know, because I never actually studied the files and all that kind of stuff. I never quite understood the uh, the allegation. Was the allegation about emissions? Yeah, from the allegation was that, that they basically stunted up a different set of emissions figures yes. to, uh, to, to satisfy the various um, regulatory authorities. Right. In fact, um, uh, they were using completely and utterly different models yep. to test the emissions rather than the actual models that were being sold. I see. Okay. That's basically where we well, are. Well, if that's the allegation, I don't wish to get into it. That sounds to me like uh, commercially sensitive material. Material, okay? Commercially sensitive material. Yes. Well, uh, it's published in many newspapers this morning, so Is I'll be it? able to quote liberally from those. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I would also like to tell you, uh, mm. with the, with an eye on Mercedes, I was poking about down in the underground car park today. Poking about, yeah, poking were you? about trying to work out whether mm. I could get into the car. You know, oh, sorry, you, your old wreck of a Mercedes. My, my yes, Mercedes, yes, yes, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And a guy uh, was watching me from outside behind the, you know, because it's a, um, you know, it's a, it's a sort of a, a sliding. Uh, metal door yeah, uh, with holes in it. And so he, he thought me. you might have been a bit dodgy. He thought I was a bit... I, I didn't know why he was watching me and right. I was starting to get more and more irritable about yeah. it. And I thought, you know, why is this guy watching me? You know, yes. And he parked sort of behind my car and obviously was wondering if I had the right to be in there and all this. Yeah. But as I as I thought that, I was, it turns out to be completely wrong. Mm. He wants to buy the car. Oh, really? Yeah. He's making an approach. He wants to buy the car. Because I was coming out... Well, he did came you tell up, him that you can't actually get into the I car? I saw a lot of trouble at the moment. Yeah. Battery's flat. He said, I don't care. And he said, how much do you want for it? I said, about a grand. He said, OK. He said, well, let me know when you get the battery going and I'll come and drive it and uh, we'll have a conversation. Oh, couldn't you have thrown the responsibility to him? Well, I don't think you could sell a car to a guy if it doesn't actually move. No, but if he wants the vehicle... I mean, I know you would want to do that. No, no, no. If he wants the vehicle, you could have said, you could honestly have said to him, um, look, do you know how these things work? Can you, uh, you know... Help me to... Well, I'll tell you what he did say to me. He oh, said, have you checked that the uh, that the actual key fob is not the thing that's flat and maybe well, the well, battery's I, I fine? I said that to you the other night. And I said, well, do you know what? I'm going to take that now to the uh, yeah. to the key place. Yeah. And they tested it and the key fob's fine. OK. So it's obviously the battery. It is the battery in the but car. I still, yeah. But I still can't get into the car. I still don't know how to do that. Don't you have a little garage down there somewhere? I mean, it's Bermondsey, basically, isn't yeah. it? And in Bermondsey, there's lots of sort of under the arches type uh, little garages there and that are, kind of stuff. But I'm not sure And if you go they... to one and say, hello, mate, listen, can you help me? Bung the guy a 20 yeah. just to... Is this your uh, sound advice to me? That's why I always sort things out and just say, listen, can you... Um, I tip the paper boy. What paper boy? My paper boy. I didn't know you had a paper boy. I have a paper boy. He yeah. delivers papers to me very early. Uh-huh. Uh, I gave him 40 quid. 40 quid? Yeah. That's a lot of money for a paper boy. Yeah. Is he a paper boy or is he a bloke? He's a paper... Man. Uh, juvenile, I think. Paper juvenile. Difficult to tell, actually, because yeah. he, he's, he's, he's a callow-looking chap, you is know. He? Yeah. And he's fit because he wheels this trolley round mm. every morning from 5am yeah. onwards, you know, doing all the papers But he's not like hills. 10 or something. So, oh, no, 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 no. He's, uh, he, 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 he's definitely a late teenager, uh-huh. in my view. Right. And... Uh, uh, he was overwhelmed. But Absolutely anyway... He was. 40 quid's a lot of money for a paper boy. Well, money makes the world go round. I keep telling you this. Yeah. So all I would say is... Go and Are fi- you going to declare that to the tax man? Uh, no, because it, it, co- no, it no, it comes into the... At this time of the year, mm. taxmen allow you to pay gratuities without them being taxed, yes. Oh, OK. Yeah, I've, I've explored all this. That's honestly. quite yeah. handy. Yeah. So I would go and find a guy in under the arches, yeah. little garage, yeah. offer him 50 quid... 50 now? To You've jump, 20 yeah. before. Well, it depends how far away it is. And just say to him, listen, mate, would you just come and, and sort my car? And he jumps in your jag, you find yeah, him around the corner. Yeah, but he can't jump in the milk, though. How do you open the car? No, 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 you explain to him what the problem is. Yeah. He'll bring a tool with him to right. get into the car right. or get the bonnet off. Yeah. and get your battery fixed. Mm. Believe me, these right. guys know what they're doing. OK, all right, well, I may try that. Maybe something for next week. I don't think it's time no, to no, do it No, 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 do it this week. Do it before Christmas. Get it done. I've only got tomorrow now. Oh, I see. And then you're going to go right through Christmas Day and Boxing Day with this on your conscience. Well, it's hardly on my conscience. Your mobile it? car. Well, the car, which is no longer movable because it's got do a flat that. battery. I couldn't just I couldn't just defer a problem, which I know needs solving, Why? and say, right, I'm going off on two-day celebration with my family. Oh, and right, to so hell, I'll cancel Christmas, shall I? To hell with my responsibilities. Yeah, I'll just cancel Christmas and say, look, terribly sorry, I've got to hang around waiting for a guy to jump-start my car that I don't use anymore. No, you should get it done before Christmas. Ridiculous. This Easy. is Talk Sport. Sport. We are the two mics, and of course, it is Porky Vision coming up a little bit later on tomorrow. Uh, the Porky quiz is going to be fascinating because it's going to be very, very different. It's going yes. to be twelve questions instead of ten, yeah. and it's going to be straight out of the trivial pursuit. I was going to say completely um, random, yeah, completely random completely trivial pursuit. Random. We're going to have a trivial pursuit game, excellent, uh, where the questions will be picked. And in fact, in in the way that you yes. sometimes do, you can roll a dice if you like. I will, yeah, and I'll just pick a, a questions at random and see how you do. We're going to make it like. 
if it was uh, Christmas Day afternoon in a million homes around yeah, Britain. Exactly. Playing trivial pursuits in the afternoon after yeah. your Christmas lunch. Okay. I think it's a very good idea. Exactly. Uh, now here's this uh, story about Mercedes. I finally German car giants mm. Mercedes have been thrown in on about this. as it emerged the average gap between the real world fuel consumption mm. and lab results for their cars is 54 percent. The Mercedes A and E classes are burning 56% more fuel on the road than is claimed in their sales brochure, mm. according to a report where the Transport and Environment's uh, Mind the Gap after emission analytics found their diesel engines emitted four times the legal limit yeah. for nitrogen oxide last year. Yeah. Shocking, isn't it? Is it? It is. Well, it means they've been gerrymandering oh, the test results. Do I look shocked? They've been gerrymandering the test results. Well, I, I'm sorry, but... You don't care, do you? Well, it's it's a matter of not great concern for me. I really? mean, if you look at what's happening in the world at the moment, yeah. you've got the desperate situation in Germany, yeah. which your heart must go out to, because think of the number of families who are going to be so distressed there over Christmas. Yeah. We've got the desperate situation in, in Aleppo. Yeah. You've got wars going on all over the world. Yeah. You've got... You know, um, terrible, terrible tragedies happening as Christmas comes. You've got homeless people are going to be on the streets. You've got mm. the Salvation Army going around to see old people who are aged in their 90s Since when have on you their started own. caring about all these on issues the... around the world? Well, I care about them more than I care about some blinking report about, you know, how many miles uh, per so gallon you, you get in a Mercedes the, the, car. Oh, you know, so you don't care that the people who manufacture your car have been deceiving consumers and cheating environmental rules then? Well, to be honest, I think you have to look after yourself in life. And if you're being cheated by somebody, I think that's a one to one issue and you take it up with the people who are cheating you yeah. and if they're cheating you and depriving you of something that's yours I should go in and you know deal with them in the appropriate manner uh, which could be anything from taking legal action to sending the boys around to teach them not to mess with you. I see. Okay. Well, lawyers have likened the issue at Mercedes to the scandal which enveloped German rival Volkswagen, uh, which had faced a torrent of criticism of government probes after acknowledging that it installed defeat devices mm. to flout emissions rules on some 11 million cars. Yeah. Yeah. Audi's the second worst brand, of course. Mm. So it's not looking good for the old German car manufacturers. Well, you know, again, could I Maybe say I think people car. in Germany got a lot more to worry about than the amount of miles per gallon they're getting out of their cars. Yeah, okay. I think, I think, I well, think I'm not talking somewhat, about people in Germany, I'm talking about you. I think it's somewhat, somewhat, I think it could be somewhat um, inappropriate of you. Really? To start examining uh, issues in Germany I'm not examining them. relating I'm, I'm, to I'm, the car industry. I'm simply reporting a report uh, which has come to my notice, right, mm -hmm. uh, about a car which you own, which is why the, the story is relevant in this particular well, instance. Can I can I put your mind at rest and tell you I'm very pleased with my car and everything about okay. it, and therefore I don't need to take up the baton on my behalf. Thank you very much indeed. In Find case, something better to moan in about. In that okay. case, I shall say no more. Thank you. Uh, here's one from Jeff who says, you should have a spare fob with a key to open the door in the fob. Well, I've got a key. Yeah, but the fob's which, not the problem. Well, no, but the, but the key doesn't open the door. That's the weirdest thing. Now, is there a lock on the door? There is. Where is the piece of metal formerly known as a key or, yeah. or whatever it is it's, to it's, open it? It's, 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 it's part of the same uh, electronic device which opens the door automatically. So, no. so you press a button and the key comes out, right? I, I see. It's one of those. You don't remember when yeah, you yeah, had... No, no, before, I do. I before do. they invented the new kinds of keys... Yes, I do. You would have a fob. Well, haven't you got that then? Yes, I have. And the key comes out, and yeah. I put the key in the door, and it, won't open and it, it. doesn't open. Oh, I see. That's right. the thing okay. that's mysterious. Almost as No, though... that's not mysterious. You're doing that wrong. Why? Have you tried that in the passenger door as well? I've tried both, yeah. For right. some reason, it doesn't open the door. Right. I can't, I can't explain why that would be. I bet but... I could open that for you. Do you? Mm. You think? Mm. How do you, why, what do you think I'm doing wrong? I mean, I've tried, I think, I've tried I th putting it in, you know, both ways. Yeah. I've tried turning it right, turning it left. Have you, have you, tried... Have you tried withdrawing it like one-tenth yes. of a millimetre to get it in exactly the right place? I've it tried has to, to be. Yeah, I've tried. That's what I was doing today when the yeah. guy was watching me, and I'm thinking, this guy thinks I'm, I'm up to no good. I'm trying to break in, yeah. Trying to break mm. into a car, which well, is not mine. OK, it's a problem that needs solving, obviously. Yeah. Mm. It's very strange. Very strange mm, indeed. Very strange indeed. Um, now, I'll tell you what I want to talk to you about, actually, because this is quite interesting. Yeah. What I have found out in my research, uh, which is here, I've got my research papers here, have you? is that, um, did you know, I mean, I know, I know maybe, you know, it, it uh, doesn't resonate with Christmas, but, you know, about this time last year, mm. or it might have been two years ago, there was a tremendous problem at um, Terminal 5 at Heathrow when the luggage all started piling up. Yes. It wasn't a strike or anything like that. Yeah. It just all went wrong. Yes. Do you remember? Yeah, the system inside. When you see, in fact, one of those die-hard movies you see, don't you? All that's the different it. Uh, that's you know, yeah. cases yeah. going up that, and down and sideways and all that. Now, it meant that people were flying off on exotic holidays mm. and we're being told, look, we're really sorry, but your luggage will follow. Yeah. And sometimes it did and sometimes it didn't. Mm. Did you know that after a certain period of time, and I think it's um, a, a relatively short period of time, yeah. two months, 
not in that situation where British Airways are responsible or, or another airline are responsible, yeah. but where people actually leave luggage in the uh, left luggage department yes. or just abandon it at airports. Mm. Believe it or not, some mm. people come home and because they're so anxious to get home or they've got an appointment yeah. or they've got a family crisis, they just leave their luggage on the carousel. Oh, they really? never pick it up. They yeah. just leave without it. Thousands of bags mm. a year. Mm. And did you know that this then goes to a company that makes its money by taking the cases, keeping them for two months yeah. and then selling them blind right. at auctions? To whom? To anybody who comes to the auction oh, really? and bids for them blind. Oh, right. They don't open them. They, they, you have to buy them. It's like them. that show from America. Exactly. American the garage. Where they, where they buy the storage locker. That's but right. They don't know what's in That's it. right. Yeah. No. Yeah. So listen to this. Inside a dingy auction house in South London, a mm. motley crew is gathering cockney traders, young eBay sellers, shopkeepers, charity fundraisers, and tourists. Uh, the regulars glare at the first time as especially and grumble about newcomers coming and pushing up the prices. Uh, the newcomers pretend not to notice and bury their face in the auction headlines. What? Everyone takes their seats, right? Yeah, I missed that last bit. Uh, sorry, uh, and bury their, their faces. faces in their auction oh, catalogues, yes, okay? Right. okay? Yeah. Everyone takes their seats and the excitement begins to build. Unlike a traditional auction, no one's here to bid on art and antique wars. Uh, vase. Today's prize lot will be other people's dirty laundry. Mm. It sounds strange to many, but it, uh, this is exactly what it is. It's called Greasebees, the biggest auction house in the country for lost luggage. Right. It auctions off 200 suitcases a month, wow. which major airlines at Heathrow, including British Airways, are unable to, reu- to reunite with their owners. So after which period of time are they allowed to do this? Because you, it sounds like a very short time. Yeah, yeah, like, I, after I'm, like I'm two months? That. I'm getting to that. The catch for the people who are buying is this. Bidders are forbidden from opening the cases before they buy them. Yeah. You have to buy them blind. Yeah. It means you could end up with a suitcase packed with Vivian Westwood gowns yeah. and Yves Saint Laurent suits, right. or, more often, scuffed flip-flops and Primark bikinis. I suppose you could take a view on the sort of suitcase you're buying. Like, yeah, for example, I suppose if it's so, a yeah. Louis Vuitton yeah. original yeah. suitcase, it, there might be more stuff in there that you'd want. But that would be more expensive, obviously, in the I auction. Yeah. yeah. It says, it says um, for anyone who has ever lost a suitcase, it's disconcerting to think of strangers rifling through your used holiday clothes, but for savvy bargain hunters, this twice monthly auction is a treasure trove. Right. As an East, uh, so they, they they've gone and um, this research that I'm looking at, uh, they've they've got a a, a, um, a specimen buyer, right? And they've called him Gary, okay. but his name's not Gary. Right. So Gary sits uh, uh, into the auction house. Uh, it's his livelihood. So lucrative is the industry that the divorcee, this is Gary, they're saying he's a divorcee can spend four months of the year travelling around the Far East to Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam, going to similar auctions. Really? Yeah. So what sort of stuff does he get, and how does he make his money then? By selling it on? Uh, Selling it on, yeah. Right, he said, most of the valuable items that you find in um, suitcases, electrical electrical equipment such as phones, hair straighteners, tablet computers, have already been removed and will be auctioned off separately. Ah. So you don't get them. Right. but, But you have to go to a different auction. Right. But I'm told most of the valuable... Uh, sorry, um, but new clothes with the tags still attached and toiletries, mm. oh, they're also removed and yeah. sold separately to maximise the auction house's profits. What, so new clothes are removed? New clothes are right. removed. So what's left then? And so are untouched toiletries. I'm getting to that. Personal items such as photographs yeah. are also taken out so right. as not to embarrass the owner of the case. OK. You are actually left buying someone's dirty laundry, OK? Right. Uh, and this comes from a lady called Christine Satchett, who's the owner of the auction house. Uh, she says, but the regulars know that if you get it right, there's money to be made and the tension is etched on the faces as the auction begins. Yeah. It says the room falls silent as Christine, the owner of the company, walks to the front of the room and lays down the house rules. All sales are final, and if you haven't paid by 3pm on the day of the auction, you lose your £100 deposit, which you have to pay before well, you I enter. I still don't get what they're making money on. Well, hang on, I'm getting to this. Um, right, so um, here's a typical case. Uh, lot 57, uh, it's a solid black American tourist suitcase. Yes. A Google search on a smartphone will tell you that it would retail brand new in John Lewis for £109. Right. The wheels are all working, and most importantly, it looks clean. The only other detail is that it can, uh, that, that is uh, given available to the purchaser is it contains women's clothing. Uh-huh. Cases are separated into five categories. Women's clothing, men's clothing, children's clothing, African clothing and Asian clothing, OK? 
<laughs> it's amazing. That is amazing. Mm. I still don't know how they make any money, though. Well, here, I'm, I'm getting to this. Well, we haven't got time to get to it. No, don't no. finish it at four o'clock. Hang on. When lot 57 is called, you hold up the card to be £15, and then you find yourself pitted against the other. Right. Price goes up to £26. Uh, I've got it at £26. You go to pay for it. Now, what you do then is uh, you actually sell the suitcase right. and throw away the stuff inside. Oh, I see. So you make money from selling the suitcase. That's right, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, you can buy an American tourist a suitcase for a lot less than 26 quid. Well, can you? Yeah. Well, a good, big, solid one with wheels well, I mean, working like, the one and all that. I, the one that I brought to Scotland is an American tourist. I'm pretty sure it cost me about 15. Yeah. It's, so, it's, I mean, there's something yeah. wrong with this picture. Yeah. It says uh, 23.1 million bags are lost every year around the globe. Yeah. Well, I remember I told you when the fog was on at Heathrow on Saturday, we were driving up to Glasgow. Yes. I remember a few years ago. I was ago, there, actually, with you. No, I'm saying, do you remember yes. when I was telling you? Oh, yes. I know you were there with me. I was just reminding you of when I told you the story about a few years ago yeah. when they had a terrible fog-bound yeah. problem at Heathrow. Yeah. They basically said that they were going to take all of these uh, lost luggage-type uh, bags. Right. They put them in the middle of the runway and set fire to them. That's, oh, oh, that's this, right, yeah. And they set this huge blaze because it was the only way they could clear the fog. Yeah, that's right, and get rid of the stuff at the same time. Yeah, exactly. Almost, a, this is amazing. Sometimes, yeah. um. Seems a very odd way to make a living. It's yeah. the sort of thing that the guy that stole my shirts would do. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah. I, think, I think you're right. Shocking. But Absolutely shocking. Anyway, we've got lots more to talk about. Indeed. Uh, apart from uh, your riddle of the suitcases, yes. which yes. is to many, to many people will be a riddle. Yes. Because nobody knows why it's going yes. on. John Krieger coming up next. Y'all don't need to feel real sad, even though the world is crazy bad. We need to unify. There's one big team on a field of dreams Four years, one cup Turn the awesome up I really love this world When the people sing Thanks, buddy For the real nice soccer We're all coming together And we're gonna kick that soccer ball This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to be talking to America's top dating expert. And, of course, uh, we'll be doing Porky Vision as well, Mm. uh, which will have followed that camel uh, very much as a high feature. Now, how about this from Goats Rob, uh, who says, never mind Trivial Pursuit, how about a game of Cluedo? And he's done uh, one of those mock-ups of, uh, Mm. he's got Reverend Green, uh, Mrs. Peacock, and then he's got you uh, as Professor Plank instead of Professor Plum. Thank you very much indeed. That's That's very kind of you. That's very good, Rob. Except it ain't me. Uh, It is not you. No, No, indeed. It's a Christmas prank. Mm. Uh, uh, we should say. Let's talk to John Krieger, our man in the US of A, because uh, he's going to fill us in on exactly what uh, is going on with the Formula One uh, new season, now that it's owned by John Malone, this uh, guy who's an American billionaire. John, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Good morning, gentlemen. It's good to be here with you. Yeah, now, mm-hmm. this Formula One story is fascinating, isn't it? Because it looks as though, uh, having wrestled the kind of um, uh, the rights to run the, the business from Bernie Eccleston, even though he's staying on as chief executive, basically, uh, he's got quite a few plans, hasn't he, Mr. Rimalone? He has indeed. And, and by the way, this is top reporting reports coming out on both sides of the Atlantic, but being spearheaded by the Telegraph coming out, that uh, John Malone, who is the new owner of... Uh, Formula One has the controlling stake in the company, isn't really keen on the fact that there isn't a whole lot of parity in the sport right now. And, Mm. you know, we saw at the end of this last season, it was really a two-horse race. It wasn't if Mercedes were going to win the title. It was which Mercedes driver was going to win the title. Sure. And, uh, and, And so this, you know, it doesn't really mesh with the American business model. And so since he's coming in and he has said on multiple, multiple fronts, that part of the reason that he has come in is he believes the sport can be rather reinvigorated, so it isn't just all the Mercedes Silver Arrow show through things. And the plans that are coming out is that he is talking about trying to institute a cap on how much teams can spend on the operation of their cars in a season. Now, Mm. we've seen proposed spending caps before. They've always ended with some of the bigger guns threatening to walk away or throw their toys out the pram. But uh, this is... It's rather in line with the American business model because uh, there is not a single U.S. sport that doesn't have some sort of financial parity on its books and in its operating structures. Mm. And so if you have an American billionaire that's taking this over, they're going to sit there and say, look, yes, we have some great teams at the top. We have Red Bull. We have uh, Mercedes. We have uh, Ferrari. But you also have teams like Haas, the uh, U.S.-based racing team, and and uh, some of the other Force India and things like that that really don't have the chance to compete to finish atop the constructors or the drivers' standings. Mm. And so you have a situation there where I think you're going to see a a harder push 
to try and bring the entire grid into line because it will make for a better racing environment if you're not quite sure which manufacturer is going to come away with things at the end of it. Sure. Mm. And, and somebody who's, who's with Liberty on this says basically that they don't see that it makes any sense to have teams spending the better part of 320 to 350 million quid because it doesn't do anything good for the fans. It's wasted, they say, on competing on technology. But, I mean, presumably the top teams are not going to wear this, are they? No, I don't think they will. I think it's going to be a hard slog. And I also think, much like financial fair play, if we're honest, uh, if you go into the football world, um, there are always going to be people that will f- try to find loopholes in the spending with con- community investment and everything else and, and kind of sponsorship deals, uh, you know, like the deal with Etihad that is, uh, you know, in, on, on the sky blue half of Manchester and all the other different things um, that have people scratching their heads and, and wondering just a bit. And so I think he's going to have a, a long road to hoe here. But the problem is, or at least the problem for the F1 team is, they cannot argue the fact that the excitement of a general F1 race, unless you are really into the technology of the cars, is coming down to a scant number of teams. And so Mm. if you're going to try to continue to rekindle race attendances, and another plan that we're seeing is that he also wants to include more American races. Yes, I know that'll make some people cringe, but you're looking at racing in bigger American cities, not just the circuit of the Americas in Austin. Um, you know, he is trying to bring, bring, I think, with this floated out test balloon, perhaps more neutrals in. And so you're right. I think Ferrari, I think Mercedes, I think Red Bull, the halves of F1 won't wear this very well. Mm. But it's, it's, it doesn't go without saying that they need to bring more neutrals in and I think more competition in. And so I think this isn't the last you'll hear of it. No, you see, the thing is, John, looking at it from the outside here, what the Americans try to do is the Americans believe in the survival of the fittest, it less it's a commercial uh, interest. And that's why you have the draft in American football, isn't it? To try and make commercially the competition more appealing by making each team closer to each other. The problem with Formula One is it can't work like that because of the nature of the sport, and that is the first car over the line is the best car. And do you know what? You just said that this has been tried several times before to even things out in Formula One, and do you know what I think will happen? I think they'll have a go at it, it won't work, and then what will happen is Bernie Ecclestone will suddenly come back into the business and revive it again. Well, Porky, you conspiracy theorist, you. But you may not be uh, far off there, and you're also right in that we do have parity on the American side of things. I think there are proposals that can be put out there, uh, and I think that Bernie Eccleston would would do well to to let John Malone try to do some things. I think think you're right. He would be perfectly willing to come back as as conquering saviour. But the thing of it is, you're right, it's the first car over the line. Yeah. But But, but surely if all the cars... But if they can make it so that all the cars are more or less the same... But you can't dumb down a car. Yeah, but what you can do is you can limit the amount people can spend on developing the car to make it better than somebody else who can't spend that money. But you get round that, don't you, John, by spending in other areas which, you know, you claim are you know, bolt-ons to the original plan. I mean, they'll always get around it. There are ways to do it. Yeah, they, you know, they'll say, oh, well, I'll tell you what, we'll make it a carbon fibre because that's cheaper than metal or something like that. It's been, it's been tried, you know, quite a few times in the past. It's never worked. No, it hasn't, and that's because you're right. There are always loop around. I brought up the financial play, fair play angle before. I think it's the same, we'll have the same thing in F1. Yeah. You know, one of the biggest fears from some of the lower-end teams is that some of the top teams, Porky, you're absolutely right, Mm. are owned by auto manufacturers. And so instead of spending Mercedes-AMG Petronas, spending X amount of dollars on development, Mercedes Motor Car Group will spend something on some new technology, and then Mercedes-AMG Petronas would perhaps just rent the technology at a lower fee and get in under the cap. The one thing they would have to do, I think, to make this work Mm. is declare that even if your F1 team is sponsored by a motor car company, mm. it is a separate entity and must pay for things at market rate. Yeah. And, and if what they about, do that, mm. you could close that loophole. And what about John Malone? Because obviously, I mean, my, myself and Porky know a little bit about him mm. from when we worked in the States with Liberty Media and he was always going yeah. sort of mm-hmm. head-to-head with Rupert Murdoch. But, but a lot of people listening won't know too much about him. Uh, give us a sort of pocket uh, description of his history and what Liberty Media does. Well, Liberty Media is a, a media distribution. Uh, uh, it's a media uh, distribution company, and he's made his money in trying to um, kind of redistribute um, programming and sports and, and things of that nature. So they're invested in sports and uh, entertainment groups. They're yeah. invested in Sirius XM radio, uh, 
radio and the other sports and entertainment groups. They have a, a stake in the Atlanta Braves, and yeah. they also have the Liberty Media Group, which uh, includes investments in Time Warner and Viacom and some other mm-hmm. interests. And so they basically they're an outside player mm-hmm. on some of the American media ventures and interests, and that's how they've kind of made their money. And, mm-hmm. and now they're going into the sporting world, and uh, with their experience on the outside with the Braves Group, they are uh, someone they're trying to get in not only with the distribution side of things, but with the product generation mm. side of things mm. and having an ownership stake in F1. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now, just before we let you go, John, a couple of other yeah. quick questions. I don't want to get too far deeply into American sport uh, because Porky doesn't think any of it's of very much interest over here, which, of course, he's wrong about. However, uh, MLS, um, we've got uh, a new season coming up uh, relatively soon. We've got the January transfer window coming up here. Um, are you hearing any, any, any noises about any players coming over there? I mean, it looks like everybody's going to China at the moment. You know, every, yeah, everybody is really going to China. We haven't really heard too much ramp up uh, of transfer activity in the January window. The big focus on MLS this week is on expansion because this is a year that two new clubs will enter MLS, Minnesota United and Atlanta United. And MLS have uh, also indicated that they will allocate further spots. And there are 10 cities around the United States who are rumored to be vying for those clubs. And so... We've got uh, a couple of early transfers. Chicago Fire have brought in a Legia Warsaw, a striker that no one over here had ever heard of before Fire said they were the next big, he was the next big thing. Uh, and uh, the U.S., uh, with the winter window, really, I don't think is a time when you'll see a whole lot of business done. The big thing in MLS, Mike, is uh, the fact that we've got two new clubs in Minnesota and Atlanta, and uh, the league continues to expand to the country's biggest markets and try mm-hmm. to make uh, its foothold against the other sports. Uh, what's Jürgen okay. Klinsmann up okay. to? Well, Klinsman's been uh, dispatched of his duties. He is done. Bruce Arena mm. is now the head mm. coach of, of U.S. Men, the U.S. men's national team. Klinsman was let go after uh, two subpar outings in the first round of the hexagonal World Cup qualifying. Arena is coming in for his second bite of the cherry and managing the U.S. team. And the big thing there, Mike, is that he is saying that a lot of his player pool for selection will come from teams in MLS. That's going to make some people very upset because Klinsman's uh, philosophy was that players – needed to play in Europe, and so we're waiting his first team selection to see how much will be uh, come home and play if you want to play for the Red, yeah. White, and Blue. Yes, but is he staying, but is yes. Klinsman staying in America, or is he going to come back to Europe and try and get himself a club job? Well, right now, I think he's going to take his payout and buyout. His family loves living in Los Angeles. He is He's kind of Americanized in that way. I think if the right club came around, he'd like to come in sort of at the top end of things and take over. I'm not sure he's one to come in and try to to build a club and try to take them up because I think there's a little too much scrutiny there in the press. I don't think the job's out there that's right for him right now. I think he stays in L.A. and spends some time on the beach for a while. All right. No mm-hmm. problem at all. John, thank you very much indeed and a very Merry Christmas thank to you. Thank you, John. Because uh, we we'll probably won't speak to yes. you before that, but we'll speak to you perhhaps in the new year. Mm. Uh, you see more. the way I cut through, you know, all the boulder dash about the no. whole issue and said, at the end of the day, Ben Eccleston will come back. That's what's important to you, isn't it? Sorry? That's what's important to you, isn't well, it? Well, I said, at the end of the day, Ben Eccleston will come back well, in. Ben Eccleston and, won't have to come and, back in because he's, yeah. still, he's still the chief exec. That's what I mean. But he, but he will suddenly assume total control of Formula One no. again, as he has done for the last 30 no, years, I don't think so. and uh, pocket another couple of uh, billion quid because he's one of the most clever businessmen in the world. Well, we shall see. Yes. Talk. This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out. And uh, after the show tomorrow, uh, we can tell you that we're going to be on the warm up on Christmas Eve uh, yes. from 11 until 1. Yes. Uh, before the rugby goes out in the afternoon. That's right. And there'll be a bit of a festive flavour to that show, I would imagine. There will definitely be uh, a festive uh, flavour to that show. Santa will already be on his way. Indeed. Uh, now, a couple of people being rather disingenuous about my old car. <laughs> Excuse Stephen yes. Merthyr yes. Tidville says, yeah. Mr. Graham, your car is obviously an old drink. Mm. I think he means something else, but Corrective's text has uh, ruined it. Yes. Just throw a brick through the window. Then open the door. Well, actually, I've got a better idea here, and this comes from Cristiano. Thank you very much indeed. He says, try and put D40 where you put the key. It happened mm-hmm. to me before, and I put D40. Is that D40 the... Well, like the oil. Uh, is that WD40? Yeah, yeah, that's the stuff, yeah. Now, I'll tell you about that. That works. Do you know why? Yeah. I've, it's a uh, lubricant. It's a lubricant. Yeah. You're right, yeah. Now, in, in, uh, in my uh, Surrey pad, right... Yes. I have in my... I have two sinks in the uh, kitchen. Two sinks. Next to each other. Why do you have two sinks? Well, you have one, like, is a proper sink, and the yeah. other one's got a waste disposal in it. You oh, know you've got I mean? waste disposal? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. So you don't so, really use it as a sink, then? I do, yeah. Well, no, I mean, it's only half the size yeah. of the other one. You right. see what I mean? It's you got put a, a load of food down it. 
Oh, all the time. Do yeah, you? yeah. Oh, yeah. It's very helpful. Yeah. And does it go away, or do you have to then take a bag out of it? No, 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 no. It's it, it's it's plumbed into the yeah. waste system. Oh, okay. you know, it flushes it all out. You know, right. no okay. problem. But the point of our story is that means that the tap, which is placed right in the middle, moves left and right. Yes. And it also the type of device I have on top of the tap mm. to uh, start the water flowing. Yeah. Moves up and down right. on a circular ball cock. You yes, see what I mean? I know what you mean. And left is it and... one of those ones that's got like a, a bar almost? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so it goes up and down yeah. for water on and off, uh-huh. and it goes left and right for hot and cold. Yes. Now then, a, a, a few weeks ago, it, I noticed it started to sort of grate or jar or something, or got stiff. It uh-huh. got stiff, right? Right. And I thought. I know what's going to happen here. One of these days, I'm going to come into the kitchen. I'm going to sort of, you know, push it up or yeah. push it up. It's going to snap and off. It'll snap off, because, yeah. because it, So what I did is I went out to uh, Holford's uh-huh. and I got a tin of WD-40. Yes. Uh, you know, with a, with a squeeze in the But yeah. they always give you this ridiculously tiny little pipe. Mm. Have you seen this? No. I, yeah. I think I bought any of that stuff for many a year. Right. Well, what happens is... On a normal aerosol, you've just got the button on the top. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, yeah I've and, had that for my kids' bikes. Yeah, and it sprays out. Yeah, yeah. With the WD-40, yeah. they give you this tiny yes. little no, I've straw. Had exactly, I've had exactly that, And you yeah. stick it into the aerosol, yeah. and you can actually absolutely direct yeah. where it goes. So, for instance, in yeah. your lock, if yeah. you get the WD-40, yeah. you can direct it straight into the lock. OK, well, right? I could try that. You must try, because that's what I did on my ballcock-type tap. Yes. And immediately it went from being stiff to right. being the most right. fluid and uh, manageable mm. tap in the world. So you fixed it, basically. Oh, fixed it. It was brilliant. Oh, it was I'm so quid. proud of myself, because I thought I was going to have to order a new tap. Yeah, well done. Mm. Lee says this, MG, if you get under the car where the solenoid is and touch it with power from the JP leads, press your fob and it will work. That's a bit too complicated for me. And also, I'm not getting under the car. Well, how could you get under a car? Well, that's not happening. You'd have well, to jack a car up three no, feet for you not, to get your not, belly no, under it. No, actually not true. A 4 by 4 car is actually quite high off the ground. Yeah, you, but, in fact, you'd have to get a, stand on a box to get into it. Uh, no, not at all. Now, uh, I've got a very nice note here from Paul McCann. Uh-huh. Sounds a bit familiar, that name, McCann. Paul McCann. Were they, were they a bunch of brothers? Uh, yeah. There were some McCann, McCann brothers, brothers yeah, yeah. There were, who were in uh, all sorts of TV shows. Yeah, all they? sorts of soap operas. Yeah. And, uh, no soap operas, uh, situation comedies. Yes, that's situation right. comedies. Correct. And it says here, trivial pork suits. As in Trivial Pursuits oh, yes. for our quiz tomorrow night. Yeah. I like that very much Quite indeed. Quite excited well about the Trivial Pursuits thing. Oh, well, I'm, I, was, I was a king of it, so I'm, got a, you know, I'm feeling in, in stri- extremely confident, OK? Yes. all right. Now, Paul, Paul says this. Porky, uh, this is a follow-up to his last message, which I haven't seen. Yeah. He says, I work six days a week between 7 and 11 hours a day for a major super- supermarket. Yeah. I earn just under a £1,000. I don't know why he's telling us that. What do you mean, that. a day? Um, I shouldn't think it's a day, no. I would a imagine, week? I would imagine it might be a month, wouldn't it? Well, that's slave labour, if that's the case. Well, maybe it's a week, then. Must be a week. No, it can't be. Six days, 11 hours. Now, here's, here's his first message. He says, Paul, uh, Porky, I've heard it all now. I do not believe it. You tipped your paperboy 40 quid. Yeah. You do not live in the real world. You must have more money than sense. Well, and then when he says he earns £1,000, it must be a month, then. It must be a month, I suppose. Could yeah. be. Yeah. Um, I just thought he was worth it, because the guy has to, you know, he has to get up very early in the morning, get out, bring me my papers. I insist on starting the day with at least um, three newspapers, yes. and uh, I haven't delivered through the door. But £40 that. Pounds must be quite a large amount of money to somebody who does a paper round, you would think. Because well, how much do you think he gets for a paper round? I don't know, to be honest. When I used to do my paper rounds, I used to get about £2.50 a round, right. or £3. Pounds. That's quite a lot, though. Yeah, well, I used to do at least two a day, and on the Friday I did three because right. we had the uh, the weekly. Well, let's let's transpose that into I mean, the that... day's money, right? Yeah, yeah. So he gets a tenner. Yeah. So you basically give him four times his full time, four four days work. You'd get it. more than a tenner for delivering papers. Now I can't believe that's true. I bet you would. I pay actually a pound a day for mm. delivery. Right. So if I'm paying a pound a day for delivery over six days, yeah. that's six pounds. Right. And I think there's about. At least 100 people who mm. get their papers delivered. Uh-huh. So that's £600 yeah. a week. Yeah. Well, they're not going to pay him £600 a week, are no. they? Well, I for delivery. So. But I bet he gets £20 a day. Maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here's one from Simon in Windsor. who says, being the owner of a brand new Mercedes, I'm with Porky. I don't care one yeah. bit about anything uh, they may be getting up to as it looks magnificent and drives beautifully. Yes, absolutely. Well, I think that's terribly irresponsible of you, Simon. Absolutely. As we come to the end of the year, there's mm. a few requests here for updates. For instance, what's the situation with your shirts? Yes. Well, the situation and with that's my from shirts Nat. is that there is a police investigation ongoing. Right. In fact, I got a phone call from them on Saturday. Right. Uh, Sunday, rather, when Sunday. I was in the middle of having lunch, having glass. Go. Yes, and the phone went, and it was an unrecognised number. So I answered it, yes. and it was my local PC yeah. just telling me uh, that yeah. he was keeping me updated on the uh, process 
and progress of the investigation. Look, I and know, I said, well, that's very kind of you, yeah, PC, whatever yeah. your name is. I said, how is the progress of the investigation going? Yes. And he said, well, uh, we've now studied the CCTV footage, yeah. which, of course, I saw about three months ago. Yes. Uh, we've now passed the image of the uh, suspect to all of the other uh, Metropolitan Police stations mm. to see whether anybody recognises him. And I went, and has anybody recognised mm. him? He said, not as yet. No. So that's basically it. Well, it's very good of them to ring you on a Sunday, but I, I hate to say this, I know your shirts are important to you, but I sometimes wish the police had more important things well, to do. Well, I said that to them. Yeah. And when I was sitting in the uh, yeah. interview room for 90 minutes, yes. you know, about three mm. weeks ago, I said, are you sure you haven't got anything better to do? do than and, he, yeah. and the guy said, a crime is a crime. Yeah, a crime is a crime, you yeah. Know. Right, and the next one, and this comes, uh, of course, from Luxury Lizzie, wants to know what's happened to the one third of my heart because I've stopped moaning about it. Well, well say, uh, that's I, because I don't moan about it. It's it's because you know I sometimes have to mention it in order to put my life into perspective. Uh-huh. You know, I wouldn't say that you've stopped mentioning it. I mean, you're obviously not listening carefully enough. Yeah, yeah. I haven't heard much about one third of Mike's ticker lately and all that sort of stuff. Well, that sort of stuff is Lizzie. I just have to get on with life, and I'm not one for dwelling on the incapacities which would put other people down, but which don't affect me because of my uh, attitude in life, which is that. Uh, uh, the power of positive thinking gets you through most things. Indeed. OK. Uh, now, here's one from Tom who says, yeah. Surely the saying of 2016 is push the envelope. Push the envelope. Uh, he says, keep up the good work, uh, Mike. It's best show on any airwaves. It's very kind of you. Yeah, get on the radar. Yeah. And apparently yeah. Lee says they also have a TV show for the luggage auction as well. It's called Baggage Battles. I haven't seen that. Baggage Battles. What's yeah, that? Well, you know, we were talking about the... Uh, These the people who go to the auction. There's a TV show called Baggage Battle. Oh, I see. Which yeah. apparently is all about it. Yeah, really, yeah. 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 Oh, well, that's... Uh, OK, that's all very good. Uh, now then, uh, what we need to uh, get on to... Yeah. There's another subject that uh, I felt I had to uh, bring to your attention yes. and that we have to discuss... Right. Is the, um, ...is the situation regarding yeah. uh, whether or not... You give your pets presents at Christmas. Yes. On Christmas Day morning. Yes. Right? Well, that is a very good question. Now, what do you do? I'm going to answer it very shortly because we're slightly running out of time. Right. Okay? So I'm going to hold on to that answer. Right. If you don't mind. And give right. it to you very, very shortly. OK. Uh, when we come back. OK. Uh, because uh, I think anybody who does have a pet would probably want to buy them something just to make them feel nice about themselves. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> This is Talk Sport. We are the two mice. Charles says, so basically Porky's saying, um, uh, in, no, that's the wrong one to be reading. So Porky mm. now thinks that paper boys get £20 per day, yeah. £140 a week, £7,000 a year. Tell them to get real, the plank, man of the people. Well, that, well how much do they up. get then? Well, I mean, 7000 a year does sound quite a lot for a paper boy. Well, OK, maybe they're... £12.50 well, well, a day, half, do I would half that. £10 I would, I would a say, day? I would say £10 a day for a paper boy is a lot of money. Well, I would say £10 a day for a paper boy, before, if he delivers the paper before he goes to school, is a terrific uh, reward yeah. for a youngster age 14 or 15. Yes. But I'm telling you, the guy who delivers mine is of working age. Mm. So he's not going to do it, is he, for, like, uh, newspaper boy rates? Well, he might do, because it might be an additional job or something like that. I mean, you know, it might be for an extra 50 quid a week uh, around Christmas time. I mean, who knows? Do you not remember in uh, Coronation? Coronation Street a few years ago, Norris was the paper boy. No, I've never and watched Coronation Street. No, Street. but it, what I'm saying is he was a uh, an adult mm. who, you know, was a pensioner and didn't have anything to do, so right. he said, I'm going to come to the paper boy. Pensioners do deliver Pensioners papers do. for well, something remember to there, do. There was a case not long ago, I'm yeah. sure, about yeah. two or three, maybe a month or so ago, yeah. of a couple of guys who actually ended up going to the European court yes. to try and get what they regarded as some kind of a living wage out of the guy is that right? who was employing them, yeah. yeah. And they were two, two pensioners who decided mm. to do exactly as you said. Yes. Uh, to just, to, just something, to, something to do. Here's one from uh, Roddy, yeah. uh, who says, uh, I would always send Christmas cards out on my paper round to earn extra tips. Shame Porky was not on my round. Well, th- this guy did uh, do this last year. Did he? Uh, the, the cheapest and, and, and flimsiest uh, Christmas card I've ever received yeah. suddenly came through the door with the yeah. papers, you know, from your paper boy. Mm. And I felt so sorry for him having to deliver such cheap and tawdry bits of paper. You know what I mean? You know. Uh, what I mean, the card wasn't to your oh, liking. It was terrible. You know, I threw it in the bin immediately in case it had been stained with yeah. some sort of, you know, germ or something. And uh, was but, it one of those charity cards? Well, it wasn't anything. And also, I think I think he was stolen it from somewhere. Honestly, you know, <laughs> Maybe from the shop. He was yeah, well, no, the no, no, from. certainly not from the shop. No, but. Um, 
Anyway, so this year I preempted it and said, oh, hello, mate, how are you doing? I said, hey, I'll tell you that. Thanks very much for doing a great job. Oh, you know, and he right. was very happy. Now, right, okay. the other guy I've got to say is my, is my uh, postman. Uh -huh. He's been very good this year. Yes. Very good. Postman Pork. Yeah, Postman uh, Pork, that's right. Now... How much did you give him? Uh, Another 40. I haven't actually done it. Last year I gave him 20. Yeah. But I suppose we better up the ante this year in case he has a conversation with the paper Did boy. you ever have that situation, which I never had when I lived in New York, yeah. I never lived in a dormant building, yeah. where at Christmas time it oh, would literally yeah. cost you Definitely. hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Definitely. My sister was never... I mean, she never moaned about it. No. She just said it's what part of the, of, right. the, of the deal. But that's you've right. got the guy that's there... Because they have 24-hour dormant. That's right. They've then got people who, who clean the place. They've got, you know. You've got, you've got so there's a whole horde of people you have to pay. Well, you've got three lots of dormant in yeah. that 24-hour yeah. period, yeah. all of which you see. Yeah. You see one guy when you're going out at 5.30, 6 yeah. o'clock in the morning. You see another guy when you're coming at 6. And if you give any of them less than 100 bucks. Exactly, you yeah. Know, they yeah. look at you yeah. askance, don't yeah, they? Yeah, that's right. Uh, have I done something wrong, sir? Yeah. Is there something wrong with the service, sir? Yeah. Yeah, and all that kind of stuff. Oh, no, shocking. Now, anyway, you asked me about uh, the dog situation. Well, because I've got an example here of a yeah. woman who has spent... You won't believe this. £2,500 on Christmas presents for a dog. Well, she must have more money than sense. That's ridiculous. Uh, um, her name is Emma Butarazzi. Butarazzi, OK. Butarazzi. Right. And she has spent £2,500 on gifts for her beloved dog, Prince. Yeah. Uh, OK. Fit for uh, a king. Yeah. When he wakes up on December the 25th, the hairless Chinese crested hound... Hairless Chinese, Chinese crested, crested hound. hound. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Right. Uh, will be unwrapping uh, such goodies as an eight hundred pound toy box. That's to put his toys in. Yeah. Right. Right. Uh, a three hundred pound faux mink fur bed. Ridiculous. A two hundred and seventy five pound personalised tuxedo. Really? Where would you take your dog in a tuxedo? Well, out to dinner, I suppose. What you mean, like in your handbag or something like that? Well, I don't know how big this dog is. It's not a big dog. I've got oh. a picture of it here. Oh, right, OK. A £250 handmade crystal harness. Crystal harness? Yeah. That sounds like something from one of those S&M shops. It certainly does. And a one <laughs> and a £150 gold crown bowl from which he can drink his that water. That's nonsensical, isn't it? Right. That's nonsensical. I can tell you that, that, uh, that there will be something under the tree mm. for Ziggy. Um, but not right. only that, but he will also buy presents for some of the ki for some 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 of the other people as well. Oh, I see. Okay. I mean, yeah. obviously, he won't physically go and buy them. But no, be no, presents, exactly. But exactly. there'll be presents from him to other people. Exactly. Now, now, Ms. Butarazzi, right? Yeah. Just to go on, already pays two hundred and fifty pounds a month for Prince's luxury lifestyle. Um, she says the seven-year-old. She's got a lot of money. This woman. Well, I'm going to try and find out where her. Uh, her income comes from. It says she says the seven-year-old also follows a strict organic diet developed by his own nutritionist. Yeah. He enjoys manuka honey, steamed vegetables, apple cider vinegar, uh -huh. and a host of expensive superfood supplements, as well as coconut water only to Very drink nice. from his bowl. Very nice. His health plan even extends to having him having his own holistic vet and regular massages from a dog masseur. Well, this is obviously a very spoiled dog, and, and anybody in their right mind would say that she's clearly spending way too much money on it. It says he likes to drink coconut water, he won't drink normal water, and certainly wouldn't touch anything out of the tap. Yeah. Uh, he also has dog tea after his walk. Then I massage him with aloe vera or coconut oil. I think she needs to get life, this woman. Now, Ms. Butazari, to answer yeah. your question, is only 25 years of, old, of age, right. very glamorous blonde lady. Yeah. Uh, she runs a dog boutique called Glamour Pets, spelt P-E-T-Z. Oh, OK. So this is a puff piece for her business. In well, it looks like it, doesn't yeah. it? And she lives with her fiancé, James Powdrill, in Loughborough, Loughborough, in, your, in Leicestershire. Loughborough is where they uh, have the uh, sort of... The, the university. The, the great yeah, university of sort of sport. Isn't That's it? right, It's where yeah. people go and train to be sports coaches and all the rest of it. It was famous in my day for having the longest bar in any students' union in the world. Was it? Apparently, the bar's like 50 yards right. long or something. Yeah. All right. Um, I'm not a fan of big long bars, to be honest. By the way, you know when we were on that train the other day, yeah. to Scotland, yeah. that lady uh, stewardess who was very helpful, yes, wasn't she? She it, was. She said, "Oh, she said, I'm sorry that the buffet because we were needing some sort of refreshment. Refreshment, yes." She said, "It's down in Coach C, and yeah. she said, but uh, you know, you better go now because." And we said, "Well, why?" She said. Well, this train is hot, is quarter of a mile quarter long. Quarter of a mile long. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure that I walked a quarter of a mile, or more well, like half a mile, up yeah. to the buffet and back. And back, that's because right. Because it was a hell of a long way away. It's a hell of a long way. Mm. And, and do you know what I object to on those Virgin trains? And mm. it's a very good service, by the way. I'm not knocking on all think that. They were, I thought they were pretty good, actually. But when you go through, um, like, steerage, you know, mm. economy, um, or whatever it's called, you know, the normal... The great unwashed section, yeah, yeah, that's right, as you yeah. call it. They have, like, Mickey Mouse ears on the edge of the seats. Yes. 
which are like Is numbers. it to hold on to, though? Well, I think they are, but I, I bruised all my elbows walking oh, up and down because you're holding, you know, the beverage in your hands thought, and all yeah, that. But I thought they were for, for sort of using to, you know, to help you along or to help you get in and out of the seat. Let me just finish with uh, this dog, uh, Lof Brushes. No, she said, Prince is everything you would want from a dog. He's really well behaved and you can take him anywhere. He's just a perfect creature. And he gets really excited once he sees his toys. Mm. On Christmas Day... Miss Butarazzi will ensure her pet has turkey to eat and that he has several wardrobe changes throughout the big day. You That's ridiculous. You don't put clothes on a dog that normally. That is totally and utterly ridiculous. She says he's got a lot of different outfits, so he usually wears something Christmassy, but then he gets changed a little later on into his pyjamas or the new bathrobe I've bought him. That's nonsensical. That's all a bit over That's the top, isn't it? Eh? So, I mean, presume, I eh? as I say, it's obviously a puff piece for this woman's business. Yeah, but it, So it, I'm, I'm treating it with a, a pinch of salt. But it's extraordinary stuff, isn't it? Well, it is, but I don't believe a word of it, unfortunately. Brendan says this. I used to get £7.50 for an evening paper round Monday to Friday and three quid for a Sunday afternoon round. Yeah, that's... Uh, Tracy... so, why, why would you deliver on Sunday afternoon? Uh, so, sorry, Sunday morning round. Oh, exactly, yeah. Uh, Tracy mm. says this. Uh, son does a paper round six mornings a week before school, £3 a day and £5 for Saturday. He makes £18 a week. See, that's very good. How old is he? Uh, she doesn't say. No, but if he's 12 or 13 or mm. something like that, that's very good money. See, that's how I started. That's how I started. Yeah. As an investment person, well, when I started working in my bakery uh, job when I was fourteen, yes, I used to make about seven or eight quid uh, for about sort of seven or eight hours. Yeah, but that was a lot in those days. Which was a lot in those days, and it got up to about fourteen pounds a month. But by the time I left there, Mm. which would have been uh, sort of early eighties, I was making twenty quid a day, which was quite a lot of money. And how old were you then? um, I was well. It was I I started. I I worked all the way up to university. So right, okay, um, yeah. Well, so when I so when I would come home for the holidays, I'd work sort of six days a week in the bakery. In the bakery, I was making twenty quid a day, so I was making. 120 quid a week. Yeah, it was good. Which was very good money. I once worked in a plastics factory, right? Did you? Yeah, and I worked a uh, month. Did you have to inhale horrible fumes? No. It was the most ridiculous job. There was a recession on in this country, right? Mm. But this plastics factory, it was the end of a country lane yeah. just uh, outside Chester. Uh-huh. And I've always wondered what the building was, and yeah. it was a plastics factory. And what happened was, I what went was in there. plastics? Well, I was just about to tell you. So somebody had tipped me off that, you know, they, they took casual workers on in the summer when right. people went on holiday and this yeah. kind of stuff. So I went along and I said, oh, hello. And I, was, I know I was 17 because I was going on holiday with my mates and I needed to earn some money to spend on drink and women in Mallorca, you know, because yeah. that's where we were going. Yes. And uh, well, we had a month before we were going on holiday because, like, school normally breaks up in sort of July and we mm. go on holiday in August, you know. So I said, oh, hello. I said, uh, oh, he said, yes, and uh, you want a job here, do you? He said, yes. Have you got any experience? I said, not really, no. He said, OK, well, you'll soon learn. Mm. And he took me on on the top rate of £32 a week. Right. And I, I didn't know why. I was 17. Right. And I said that, he said, I'll, gi- I'll give you a decent rate. And, and I thought, I'm... I'm there was somebody... no minimum wage in those days either, was there? No minimum wage. Mm. Uh, something missing here, you know. Anyway... He said, OK, he said, I'll put you on day shifts this week, night shifts next week and all that. All you had to do was stand next to this mould, right. like made of metal. Uh-huh. And what it did was it, it spat out 100 lids for like sandwich, plastic sandwich boxes. Yeah. Well, like Tupperware type stuff. Tupperware type yeah. stuff about every 10 minutes. Mm. And all you had to do was open the safety guard, reach in, take the lid out and then close the safety guard again. Well, each time there was a lid made. Yeah. Well, that's quite a lot of opening and closing, isn't it? Yeah, but, it, I mean, it was the most boring and repetitive mm. job in the world. Yeah. And there was absolutely no point to it. A yeah. machine should have done it, not a human being. Right. But anyway, point is... when on the, Was when, that the only thing you did? That's the only thing I did. Mm. I didn't package them or anything like that. I just yeah. threw them into, a, like, a you know, bag. Receptacle, and then somebody, yeah. Somebody took them away. And, and uh, But on the night shift, when I... So, first week I did days, and second week I did nights. So, I got in nights, and the first thing a bloke said, I'm going to says... All right, Mike? I said, yeah. He says, is this your first night shift? I said, yeah. He said, where's your sleeping bag? I said, what? <laughs> he said, oh, right, OK, nobody's told you then. Uh, he said, all right, you can have the boxes over there, right. like, to sleep on. Yeah. And I said, but this is an eight-hour shift. I said, I'm here, this is 10 o'clock at night, yeah. I'm here till six. He yeah. says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And what they did is, as soon as the bosses went home, they speeded up the machines right. so that your work was done in half the time. So they and then stopped they went to sleep. at two, and then you slept until six. Right. You brought an alarm clock, and, and somebody woke you up. <laughs> and, and there was a huge recession on in the country yeah. at the time, right. and I just couldn't understand how this company was surviving Did and making money. Did you not money. go and uh, sort of a, a grass on the guy to the boss? No. not really? a, no. It's not like you. No, no, no. I was part of the fiddle. Mm. And the thing they equipped you with was a brass 
uh, nail. Right. Because if you used anything else on the mould to get the lead out of it stuck, yeah. it marked the mould. You see oh, what okay. I mean? It had right. to be a, it had to be a brass nail. Yeah. And if you didn't use the brass nail, mm. use anything else, you got sacked for right. for marking the so mould. So this was the same job at night as it was in the day. Exactly the same. And what about the bottom part of the Tupperware? Who was making that? I've no idea. I don't know. I don't yeah. know where they were made. Maybe in another part of the factory yeah. or something. I don't yeah. know. No, just lids. Yeah, just lids, yeah. Extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lee says this. My mate does a paint uh, two rounds in the morning and gets £70 a week. Seems well, there you go. There's a lot of disparity about what people make. There you go, you see. Well, there that's 35 quid a week for a basic paper round, 70 for two, Um, I would say. Uh, yes. So, you know. So you've given a guy basically a week's wages as a tip, which is not that bad. Well... I think he's worth it. The guy's uh, he's very reliable. He's mm. never missed a day. Yeah. You know, sometimes when it rains, sometimes it's cold, you know, you get lead uh, swingers who wouldn't turn up. This guy's always turned up. No, OK. Coming up next, we're going to talk dating uh, with America's top dating expert. This is Talk Sport. It'll be lonely this Christmas without you to hold. It'll be lonely. Sometimes Christmas can be a great time to meet people. Other times uh, it can be a very sad time, of course, because you can break up with... I'm Sorry, sure is, you... it, is this a soliloquy? Eh? Is that just you speaking, or are you reading this from something? Uh, I'm just coming out with what I'm thinking about Christmas. <laughs> Sometimes Why? it can be a lonely place, yeah. yeah. Well, it can be. Yeah. It really? can be. I yeah. mean, you know, I'm sure you may have had well, a, a situation where you've broken up with a woman. You're starting a charity to help, you know, the lonely and the, no. the disaffected Not over Christmas. Yeah. No, what, what this is called is, yeah. is setting up the guest. I know that you don't care about guests on this show, because all you want to hear is the sound of your own voice. Mm. But actually, I'm very interested to hear from Julie Spira, who happens to be the top dating expert in the United States of America. That's so incredible to have her on the show. I was trying to set the scene okay. for her and for the audience, right, yeah. uh, of how Christmas can sometimes be a but very lonely time. But it was a soliloquy. Time. You didn't say to me, now then, uh, you know, Porky, you understand that some people get lonely. You just suddenly well, started talking like you were delivering a Shakespearean soliloquy. What, you mean like somebody who's on the radio? No, 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 like, uh, you know, drama. So would you like and... me to preempt everything that I say with, now then, Porky? No, no, not would at all. Would you like me to do that? Do you know what? I'd like to hear from Julie, please. Would you? I'd like yeah. to hear from Julie as well. Julie, uh, a very, very Hi good uh, morning to you. You can see what I have to put up with here, Julie. It's not easy uh, being a, no, a co-host. No, no, it's like you're on a date with him constantly, right? Well, actually, well. he is like a very needy girlfriend, I have to say, that I've had in the past. Not but we try, uh, We try not to uh, talk mm. about that. Now then, Porky, uh, what would you like to put to Julie, who is the top dating expert in America? Well, what I'd like to say is, Julie, first of all, thank you very much indeed for joining us on our show. We, uh, we pride ourselves on having quality guests on this uh, particular piece of broadcasting. And the thing is, Julie, I would imagine the hardest thing at this time of the year is not necessarily for somebody who hasn't got a date, but somebody who's just broken up with uh, somebody who's been important in their life, because this really, it's a bit like being in prison, isn't it, over Christmas and not seeing your family. It can be the hardest time of the year to miss those that you have previously been in love with. Absolutely. And it's breakup season. The two weeks leading up to Christmas, up to 1224, December 24th, is breakup season where we see this huge spike of people just bolting out of their relationships. Maybe they don't want to buy a gift. Maybe they don't want to meet the family. But breakups are happening in big numbers right now. Is it also because over Christmas there's a bit of friction sometimes between you know, what might be prospective in-laws, you know, for example. Mm. I mean, I know people who have never spent Christmas together, even though they've been going out with each other for a few years, because neither one wants to, you know, not be with their own family for the Christmas Day celebration. Right, and then you go home without someone, and then there's always Aunt Sally who says, so do you have a boyfriend? Yeah. You know, and it just makes it very uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah, it does it's... make it uncomfortable if you're in that sort of situation. Nevertheless... When you say people bolt at this time of the year, isn't that because actually there's so much on offer at Christmas parties and gatherings and all that sort of thing? What do you, you mean, the food? No, no, no. I mean, I mean on offer in terms of you feel that you could get lucky over Christmas, really? Julie, and you don't really want to turn up a lot of these dudes with your partner, so in fact you just get rid of them. Well... 
people are in a festive holiday cheering mode, and if you do accept all these Christmas invitations, sure, you have an opportunity to meet someone new. Yeah. And if you're single, it's actually a good time to be single over the holidays. That's what I, know I mean. People say there's bad, but there's so many party invitations that you don't get in January that yeah. you get in December. That's and right. Most, and most of them are for you only, aren't they? Particularly if they're work related. They don't say you know bring your partner along. So you so you generally are out and about more than you would otherwise be the rest of the year. Absolutely. So dress up, have a smile on your face, and know that you know if somebody does strike your fancy, you should absolutely ask them out on a date before Christmas. Yeah, before Christmas, just to test the water, you mean? Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. But, now, I mean, isn't it true now, though, that lots of people end up going out on a date after they've actually slept together? You know, they go to the party, they meet at a party, yes. they end up in, in bed together, and they haven't actually well, been on a date you at know, all. Some are hooking up, some are not. But, you know, the yeah. bottom line is, is, what do you do when you meet somebody brand new and you have to buy a present? What do you get them if you've only known them for three get days? A, you get a room. Well, you see, that's that's the the thinking of an alley cat. He has the morals all. of an no, alley this cat. This is the this real boy. world, which you don't yeah. live in. He yeah. doesn't live in the real world, Julie. He hasn't well, had a date for about twenty years. No, no, don't don't take any notice, Julie. Now let's look at the focal point of relationships over the festive period, and that's the office party. Okay, now office party etiquette is etiquette. Uh, etiquette, in my view, is you go for an hour, you have a few drinks, and then you leave because anything after that is dangerous territory. It could end up in you losing your job. It could end up in you uh, having to apologise to people profusely the next morning. It could even end up with you being in jail for bad behaviour. It really is a dangerous old job navigating the office party at Christmas, is it not, Julie? I think what makes it more dangerous now than ever is somebody that's snapping photos with their cell phone and posting them on Facebook and Instagram. So what happens at your Christmas party is not what you find out tomorrow. It happens in a digital split second. And so don't kiss that office mate of yours if you don't want your wife to see. Yeah, 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 very good advice. That Thank you very much indeed. Now, what about um, you talk about the digital world in terms of, you know, these sites now like Tinder and others. Uh, Do they get busier at this time of year? They do. They do because there's also something called cuffing season and cuffing season starts around the end of November, around our Thanksgiving, and it goes till Valentine's Day. Cuffing, and that cuffing is when season, couples so. want to, um, you know, it gets cold out. They want to curl up. They want to be in a relationship. They want to snuggle up. We call it cuffing season because some gents out there actually consider it being handcuffed to a oh, relationship. Oh, I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so generally people are more like, I mean, I'm just wondering if there are lots of people who are going to be sitting around the family Christmas uh, dinner table actually playing with their phones and people think they're reading the paper. Or actually, uh, they're, on, they're on some kind of dating website. Right, they're going to be swiping right and left on Tinder. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly yeah. right. And I see something from your Twitter account, interestingly enough, that the, the most swiped my, male name in 2016 was Lucas. <laughs> Right, Lucas is, was, a, was a popular name, but in the UK, the most right swiped male names were Harry and Jay. Mm. Harry and Jay? What's up with that? Oh, that's yeah, Harry a... and Jay. Very odd indeed. What about if you do end up on Christmas Day on your own, uh, Julie? I mean, I, you know, I read a lot of your material, and you're saying you can make the, the best of it. In fact, it's not necessarily doom-laden to be able to do exactly what you want on Christmas Day without extraneous pressures from friends, family... Or even, you know, romantic uh, intenders. Yeah, you know, one of the best things you can do on Christmas Day if you are flying solo is take yourself to a movie. Take yourself to a matinee and just have a big, big bowl of popcorn and watch a film. Or if a friend invites you to their home for a dinner, yeah. accept all invitations and just go as a friend, and you never know who else might be invited to that dinner party. Well, that's uh, good do people advice, still that. do, People do still do a lot of that, don't they? They like, invite single men and single women to dinner parties in the hopes that they'll hook up together, which is kind of an embarrassing thing if you get there and uh, it's not looking good. No, but safety in numbers. So if somebody's invited 20 people, it's a lot better than inviting, than inviting three people. So, I mean, accept invitations, but don't don't just feel like you have to go out and buy everybody presents and you have to have a relationship on Christmas yeah. because New Year's is around the corner and we have another pressure day coming up. Yeah, well, 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 New Year's Eve's another one, isn't it? New Year's Eve's another one. Yeah, see, big one. See, one of the big problems for me, Julie, over Christmas is that if I end up in company with somebody who has a different speed of alcoholic imbibement to mine, that always causes problems. Every time I say, let's open another bottle and they're still drinking their first half glass of uh, warm white wine... 
there can be an imbalance there yeah. because what happens is your mood changes as you imbibe. So you might suddenly get bolder or ruder or... You're talking about yourself here. No, I'm not, no. There you are. Or, or more outgoing, whilst the person that... The other person, you know, in this particular environment is still a shallow and uh, rather withdrawn individual. That can cause problems. Well, you can be loud and have a little much too much to drink pretty much every day of the year. <laughs> and, and, and believe me, some people I know are like Well, that. you can, but the difference at Christmas, it seems to, to, to me and to, to both of us, I think, mm. is that there's a lot more people imbibing around the Christmas time period than they do the rest of the year. I mean, we call them amateur drinkers. Yeah, yeah we do, yeah. You know, because you go to pubs and there's yeah. uh, loads and loads of people in them which the uh, rest of the year they're empty. There's all kinds of Christmas parties going on. People are, who are sort of inexperienced social drinkers start to get themselves into a bit of trouble you do right the social drinkers there there's definitely going to be a lot more bubbly and a lot more drinking going on on the holidays as well as a lot more eating yes. but at the same point you know you just have to really enjoy the holidays and just be happy with yourself regardless of your relationship status exactly mm-hmm. and if you don't mind us asking julie what is your relationship status are you going to be spending <laughs> christmas with a loved one or with uh, are you alone or what I have a loved one. Do you? <laughs> do you? Well I, done. Yes, I do. And, I'm, and I will be spending part of the holidays with my loved one. Mm-hmm. OK. I oh, bet the loved one's not as impressive as I would be. But anyway, we'll gloss over that one. <laughs> Don't worry about that, Well, Jim. actually, I'm slightly worried that she refers to him, I presume to him, as a loved one. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, we must not probe into your private no, life, we Julie. Do it, that. It's, it's suffice it's to say. On. It's all on Facebook and Instagram anyway, right? Oh, oh right, OK. Well, okay. suffice to say, we are delighted that you're in a happy relationship. Yes. And, Julie, have a lovely Thank Christmas. You. Thank you very yep. much for taking the time to talk to us. And, and good luck in the new year. Crazy. But that's how it goes. Millions of people living as hoes. Yeah, but maybe... This is Talk Sport. We are the two mics coming up in the next hour. Porky Vision will be upon us, of course, and it's a Porky quiz tomorrow. A slightly different Porky quiz uh, because it's going to be based on a game of Trivial Pursuit. Uh, there are going to be 12 questions uh, picked at random as if we were playing the game, which is going to be quite interesting, I would have thought. I think it'll kind be of, great. It cuts, uh, out, it cuts out the independent quiz masters for a start. It, it cuts out the independent quiz masters. Because they said they can have no part in it. Which are on your side. I know that well, for Well, they're not really on, on anybody's no, side. I believe that money are does exchange... Uh, no, no. I, I no, think palms are being... Dreadful, uh, being being that's a with dreadful, silver. Uh, dreadful allegation, that. But also, it brings uh, the flavour of, you know, the living room at home on yeah. Christmas Day to the very show here. It does. Yeah. Daniel says this, MG, can you tell Porky I've just arrived in Chester from Plymouth? Oh. Where does he recommend for a week of bladderation here? Well, go to the Chester Grove Hotel and stay there. Quite reasonable. £240 a night, I think, is a basic room mm. uh, at this time of the year. Yeah. It might be more expensive in Christmas week or something like that. And then, if you come out the front door of the Chester Grove and turn left or right... Half a dozen great pubs within 200 yards. OK. Well, mm. well, presumably not quite at this time, but over the course of the week. Over the course of the week, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, here's one from uh, Davies. He says, I like this Julie woman's advice. I don't know yeah. which bit of her advice. Which bit likes. of it, yeah. Well, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. She was quite sensible, though, wasn't she? Well, of course she is. She's an expert, isn't she? She That's wasn't taken in by your uh, faux... Uh, sort of uh, 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 compliments and saying that you know you were better looking than her boyfriend and all that. Uh, well, I didn't I say that. I said I was a better. I, I said I was a better offer. A yeah. better, uh, no, a better prospect. I'm sorry, uh-huh. a better prospect. Uh, Martin says, "Tell the plank it's not easy being alone at Christmas. This is my first Christmas alone, and I'm not looking forward to it at all. Everyone is in a couple, but you." Well, it always well, seems I don't like agree that. with that. It always seems like yeah. that when you are, um, if you've just broken up with someone, mm. it seems like everywhere you go there are people who are couples, but yes. actually. It's not the case, is it? And in fact, nowadays, I think it's even less likely to be the case. Yes. Because more and more people will live on their own. More and more people are single. That's right. More and more people are not getting married. And in fact, I, while it may feel very depressing, Martin, uh, there are many advantages to being yes. on your own. I tell you what, I, these Salvation Army adverts sort of annoy me a bit, right? Because well, you were just telling us earlier in the show about yeah. how you know there are more important things in the world than Mercedes emissions, yeah, one are. of which was the Salvation Army's great work. Well, yeah, they do do great work, but I see these well, adverts. Apart from the adverts. Well, they, why, is it, why are the Salvation Army the only people in life who play a trombone yeah. 
with the music attached to the top of the instrument. <laughs> well, I think there was a time when older bands used to do that. Well, I actually drove that, past yeah. one of these bands in Blackheath <laughs> the other day. Yeah. And I, never, I didn't even think they still were still going. No, exactly. Never stand, you know Blackheath, when you drive around, there's yeah. kind of an island in the middle of the road. Yes. And I wouldn't stand there if I was, you know, a pedestrian because no. somebody's going to hit you. Yeah. But these guys, there was about 15 of them. And all was squeezed it the Salvation in, Army band? It was the Salvation Army well, band. Well, and and they all had, as you say, yeah. these little the bit, music tiny bits pinned of to music the top of the pinned instrument. to the top of the brass. Which makes it look like they they're still, you know, working in the 1930s yeah. or 40s or something like that. But yeah. anyway, they, they, what they do is they, you know, this wailing music in their advert, you know. <laughs> and then they show images. They play sort of hymn-like music, don't yeah, they? Yeah, they, they, do, they do, yeah. And then they show images of all these sort of really gnarled, knackered old people, you know, sitting around. Oh, in, you mean the elderly and infirm? Well, sitting around, you know, on the, like, you know, sort of flea-bitten couch somewhere and... You know, you know, well, in a in a sort of a poor yeah. sheltered housing yeah, situation. Yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. You, you know, have no compassion you know, for these yeah. people. Jim's going to be on his own. At, oh, I'm not looking forward to Christmas. How can you not Day? feel sorry for people like that? Well, I do feel sorry for them, well, but they shouldn't win. You know, I mean, the the whole idea is if you're on your own on Christmas Day, you get up. Uh, go for a bracing walk, walk right. around, you know, with your well, walking stick and you all say that, that kind but of actually stuff. there's not much going on on Christmas and, Day. Well, I mean, no, the streets but it, are deserted, No, aren't but you go out and, and then, you know, when you see people, you say, Merry Christmas, you know, and then see somebody else and say, you know, season's greetings. And they go, and, well, there's that old nutter. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't and go then, near him. And then you see all the little kids riding around on their new bikes, you know, and you say, oh... Oh, yeah, that's in the afternoon, yeah. though, isn't it? Usually it's in, in the, the morning. I mean, yeah. there's, no, there's yeah. nowhere quieter in the yeah. world. Than, than a generally sort of a you know a, 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 a countryside sort of high street, a country high street yeah, in Britain. I, I think you're right. Where there's nobody around. I think you're right. Now Julie there said, "Oh, get yourself into a movie on Christmas yeah. Day." For the first time ever, mm. they are opening cinemas in Chris, on Christmas Day I was in this say, country. That was possible in New York. I didn't know that no, they were open here. For the first time, I, I was going to pick her up on that. So we yeah. don't do that in this country. But they, they for the first time. Really? They're opening cinemas on Christmas Day. So you Day. could do that. I mean, if things get a little bit sort of, uh, you know, shall we say, less than jovial no, I'm in with, the, Parry I'm with the family. family household. Don't worry, I'm with the family. No, but if it gets to the point where you feel like you've had enough, you could nip out and go to see a movie. I've got a new outfit for Christmas Day. A new outfit? Yeah, a new jacket, new shirt. Really? New chinos. Where'd you get these from? And new uh, shoes. Where'd you get them all from? Well, I bought them from various places. Various places? Yeah, got them all Where'd you get done. the shoes from? Uh, I don't know, because they're being bought for me. What do you mean they've been bought well, for Well, they'll, they'll be at the family uh, residence when I get there. What do you mean the new outfit has been provided for you? Uh, some of it, yeah, but some of it I've chosen myself. But well, my... I mean, you know, what, these are presents, you mean? Yes, so but my gonna... new shoes are loafers. Well, the same as your old ones, then. Yeah, that's right, but they're new loafers. Right. Yeah. Well, so have they got the chain on them or not? What? They've got the chain on them. What do you mean, chain? Well, some loafers have got, like, a little kind of chain across. No, no, I've got a chain They've got a chain? No, no, no. Have they got any Gucci stripes? I think they might have. Are they Gucci loafers? I don't know. I, I don't know, because it's well, a present. Well, you haven't, well, so you haven't actually got a new outfit? I have, I have. No, I, because I, I having have. a new outfit would, in, would involve waking up on Christmas morning, yes. putting on your new outfit. Yeah, well, I'm putting on my new outfit, but, but you I... won't be putting it on until you've opened the presents. Uh, well, that's only for the loafers. Everything else is there. Now, uh... well, no, hang on. No, I'm not letting you off the hook on this. Right. I mean, everything else is there. Well, I've got my jacket, I've got my shirt, and I've got my new chinos. But where are they? In my house. Oh, OK. So yeah. they're not actually being provided for you there. No, 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 no. I bought all house. that. I oh, bought okay. all that. Yeah, so where'd yeah. you buy all that then? Uh, from a tailor, the jacket. A and, tailor. Yeah. Is this the jacket you took to the dry cleaners to get the arms shortened? Yes. I got it from. Well, you Debenhams, didn't buy it from actually. a tailor then, did you? I got it from Debenhams. 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 Very nice. But it went to a tailor to uh, be is it, shortened. Uh, what is it like a blazer type jacket? Yes, that sort of thing. Was it got brass buttons? No, it's got uh, like ordinary buttons. Ordinary buttons. Yes. Double breasted. No, single, single. How many buttons on the on the cuffs? Four. Four? Four. Mm. Yeah, counted them. Sophisticated. Now, um, do you know the one thing I do want to do? What? And I'm not sure you can do it this year now because of this industrial action. I want to fly across the Atlantic. In fact, I did it one year. and I uh, um, Fly across the Atlantic on Christmas Day and have Christmas dinner on board a jumbo uh -huh. flying into New York. Wouldn't that be great? That would be nice. That would be fantastic. Can you get Christmas dinner on a plane? Yeah, you can. Really? Yeah, if you, if, you, if, you, if you book to fly... Uh, with British Airways on Christmas Day, yeah. the flight takes off normal time, eleven o'clock, right. and then at one o'clock they serve you uh, Christmas. Uh, Is that lunch. right? Yeah. Well, all over the plane or just in first class? Well, I don't know because I 
<laughs> I've never flown in the bits at the back, so I assume... You must have done at some point. Well, a long, long time yeah. ago. See, a I long, think... long, long yeah. time ago. I think I've flown on Christmas Eve. I can still remember. I think I've yeah. flown on Christmas Eve. Yeah, and I think I might have even flown on Boxing Day, but I don't think yeah. I've ever flown on Christmas no, Day. No, I don't think I have. I thought I had, but I haven't. But I, it might have been Easter. I might have had an Easter meal or something on Easter Sunday Easter. or something like that. What yeah, do you get for so. Easter meal? Uh, looking back, I remember as as uh, ham, ham, ham. Yes. I think, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Now, as far as the industrial disputes go, I don't think the uh, the, the the airline ones are going to go ahead because I think they've sorted all those out now. They've they've made got themselves to be because these are all the ground staff rather than the actual yeah. flight. Yeah, the way staff. I'm reading it is that the airline ones won't go ahead. That another area of oh I know yeah the post offices yeah. apparently is crumbling because a people don't want to lose money and b they do feel right. and they're, they're, you know they're good public servants they mm. feel well a public servant they have an obligation to the public over Christmas right. and feel very mean when old people are turning up to get their their letters endorsed and stamped and are being turned away yeah and tears rolling down their cheeks you know their, their children won't get their Christmas cards mm. and all that kind of stuff well, I know it's not good so, so there's been a, a collapse in that one by the way I got but, to, but also as, as well as the the, the settled a strike at the airline business with, with the baggage handlers and all the rest of it, yeah. the desk operatives. Is it not the case that the, the, the pilots are meant to be going on strike at some point as well? I didn't know about that. Yeah, I think they are. I think the British Airways pilots have been talking about going on strike. Really? Or, or the cabin crew, certainly. What a great job that must be, being a pilot of a jumbo jet flying mm. across the Atlantic or yes. something like that, you know. Mm. All those glamorous uh, ladies in the uh, in the first class cabin. Glamorous all ladies. That kind of stuff, yes. Well, hang yes. on, you're supposed to be driving the plane. You can't flying. be chatting... Uh, well, we could call it driving. Yeah, no, you're no. Just, it's fly, you know, well, flying, you can call it driving. It's a sort of... It's a, it's a colloquialism, but um, you can't be spending your time chatting up the ladies in first class. Well, you know, you, isn't that a dereliction of duty? Well, you're you the captain is the is like the captain on a ship. Yeah. You are the boss, and you have to. Yeah, but you're not like sort of Captain Queeg or whatever, are you? No, you no, do no. Whatever you want. No, no, but you no, but you have to make sure there's a spirit of togetherness on the uh, amongst the crew uh, on the plane. Yeah, but doesn't mean Rogerising them all so that they all get to the point where they're well, not you, doing their jobs. You properly. see, once again, you illustrate your alley cat moral. Did I say anything about that yeah, sort you of did. behavior? You, you know, said I with all the wonderful ladies in first class. Yeah, but I mean, they make the place look good, don't they? In those uniforms they wear. I mean, that's all no, I'm saying. I thought saying. you were talking about the, the people in the passenger seats. No, no, I'm talking about the staff. Oh, I'm I see. talking about the people who, who run the plane. Right. Um, what I was going to say is, yeah. I saw a very sharp message directed at me earlier in the day when oh, I was yeah. doing other things. Uh-huh. I'm in a show called The Clash of the Titans, by the way, over Christmas. Don't know if you knew oh, that, you? Yeah. No, you didn't tell me. Didn't you get an invitation to join it? I don't, I oh, don't, I don't do you? those shows. Oh, right, OK. No. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was that you didn't work on Sunday. I don't. But it wasn't recorded on Sunday. Oh, well, I didn't know it was recorded. Oh, really? Are you supposed to say it's recorded? Uh, well, yes, because it's going out more than once. I so uh, what we did is uh, we put it in place for the first live performance. So when did you record it? No, we haven't. We've, do, we've done bits of it to go into the first live oh, performance, which we will well, be so doing. Well, so you recorded some of it? Oh, just bits of where, <laughs> where, where we've been interviewing people who aren't available to talk on I Christmas see. Day. Right. Simple as that. Like who? I can't, uh, can't reveal too much uh, okay. about it. I'm sorry. Right. Now, what I was going to say was, is that... Um, you said you had a, you received a... Uh, a oh, yeah, a, yeah. So, you know, tweet. saying, you know, quite like um, the two mics, you know, Porky, OK, but really object to his you know, huge right-wing union bashing oh, yeah. agenda. That's right. Yeah, well, a lot of people well, don't like that. Well, well, I don't have a union bashing agenda. Mm. I've been a member of a union for yes. a lot of my life. It's called the National Union of Journalists, right? Yeah, but you didn't really adhere to their principles, did you? Well, I didn't like the union being used as a tool against management all yeah. the time. Right. A union should be there to stop you being exploited yes. by rogue management. Indeed. But if you haven't accorded the management, you think, well, they're managing and we're working and the paper's coming out and we're making profits and I think we should keep going. Well, true. There are some who believe that if the union isn't in place, then you would be exploited by any sort of management, of course. Yeah. But, I mean, that's probably a bit unfair. But there was a time when that was true. Yeah. You know. Oh, yeah. Uh, look, unions have a, a huge place and a huge role in society. Yeah. There's no doubt about that because... Otherwise, I mean, look, there, there are some retail issues which have been very prevalent this year, like Sports Direct yeah. and, and, and that sort of thing, sure. and and um, and Sir Philip Green, uh, Green and the BHS and all that, in which the unions play a massive part yeah. in trying to get justice for thousands of workers. Yeah. That I very much support. Okay. Very, very much support. But what I don't like is disruptive union behaviour. Because we all know it's political and it's well, not for the benefit of the workers. Certainly you can always tell yes. what's going on. I mean, funnily enough, there was an amazing picture tonight, I don't know whether you saw it, of um, mm. a southern rail train causing unexpected delays actually on a road down in Crystal Palace, right? Mm. Because it was on the back of a lorry. 
And this was a Southern Rail Where train. Where was that going? Uh, well, they were taking it somewhere. I'm not quite sure. Just show me the picture. So um, the train had been lifted off the tracks, the obviously, by a crane and was, put on the back yeah, of a lorry. put on the back of a lorry. But yeah. it then got stuck somewhere in Crystal Palace. So not only were the trains not running uh, as a result of industrial action... But, Hopeless. ..but the trains were then physically stopping cars from going anywhere. Yeah. And people were just on Twitter going, you know, how yes. can this be possible? How can this rail line yeah. be so useless? And Absolutely. Not only can they not run trains on the line, Absolutely. but when they put one on the back of a lorry, it then holds everybody up from getting anywhere. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I- uh, mentioning Crystal Palace, I think we should remind the audience that yes. on Saturday, January the 21st, yes. our show will be coming from Crystal Palace. Live from Crystal Palace. From Selhurst Park. Very exciting. Where Everton are playing Crystal Palace on that day. So yeah. the fixture, of course, is Crystal Palace versus Everton. And who knows what the, arranging, what the arrangements between those two teams will be at that time, because there'll be quite a few yeah. games between now and then. Yeah, and uh, and we will be doing the show live, the warm, Saturday warm-up show, 11 till 1. With a host of guests... Uh, with a host of guests, yeah. and uh, we are looking forward to it very much indeed. We are. Mm. But that's on the other side of the new year, of course. We've got much to do before that. We certainly this have. Talk sport. Talk Sport, we are the two mics. There will be a podcast coming out a little bit later on. Might have a couple of porky advent calendar moments coming up in mm-hmm. this hour as well. You've seen the story from New York, by the way, uh, of the guy who stole $1.6 million worth of gold flakes. No. And who's apparently on the run. No, um, you, where, where, where was that from? Uh, he did it three months ago. He took these. Uh, Is gold... this sort of like a jeweler's quarter where they brush yeah. up all the flakes after the work each well, day? Well, I don't know where they came from, but there's $1.6 mm. million worth of them in a bucket, right, which yeah. weighed 86 pounds. Mm. It was in the back of a uh, security van, mm. and this guy called Julio Nivello, mm. a.k.a. David Vargas, mm. who's 53 years old. He basically just lifted it from the van while the, while the security guy wasn't looking, yeah. which is incredible. They now think mm. he's disappeared off to, uh, to Los Angeles with the whole of flakes. Yeah. That's an incredible amount of money to be in a bucket, isn't it? It, it is incredible. I wonder how you would get rid of that. I mean, you'd need a fence, wouldn't you, I suppose? Because if you walked into any jewellers who, you know, had these signs, we buy gold yeah. and all that, and gave them a bag of flakes, they'd say these are stolen. Well, they? I suppose there are some mm. less scrupulous than others. Yeah. And if you've got to give them... And, you know, if, if, it's, all about the, it's all about the rate, isn't it? I yeah, mean, yeah. If, uh, if he's willing to accept, for example, a million dollars instead of 1.6, yes. um, somebody's making 600 grand straight off the top. Well, I'll tell you something. He wouldn't get a million dollars. He, he, w- he would be offered a quarter of million dollars wouldn't he well i mean if he's i mean if, yeah. if well yeah so, yeah so if he negotiates up to say 300 400 000, it's yes. still not bad is it yes well i suppose it's not, not of course that we're in any way endorsing the, the theft of no it. no no but there's no. loads of video yeah. footage yes of him walking down the street carrying this bucket in mm-hmm. new york right i mean look at that that's him walking down the street with the bucket that he's just stolen out of the back of a van amazing um yeah, and quite, there's quite pictures amazing. and there's a picture of him like just looking in the inside the back of the van there where uh, yeah. clearly the back of the van's just open. Yeah, just thought, oh, that's good. I'll just have a look there. Give me an inside you. job. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, I that's mean, if right. somebody came to you yeah. with a bucket mm. full of gold flakes mm. and said, "Would mm. you buy these off me for a quarter of a million?" Yeah, knowing that they were worth one point six. Well, I'd have to know they're worth one point six. Believe me. Would you not have to know whether they were stolen or not? Um, I think you'd have to have an, a, a conversation with the person concerned. Uh-huh. Uh, now then, uh, I tell you what, do you know what a quango is? Um, I do know what a quango yeah. is. It's, a, it's an artificially set up body yeah. uh, in, in made in order to uh, employ a bunch of your old mates. It's, That's basically uh, what a quango is. It actually stands for Quasi Autonomous Non Government Organisation. Yes. I.e., it's a complete fabrication. It is. And um, also, it's, it may be a non government organisation, yeah. but it's usually full of people who have either been in government at some point yeah. who are likely to be in government in the future. Yeah. Well, when David Cameron became Prime Minister the first time round, mm. I remember reading in one of my political journals that the first thing he must do when he gets in is, is to have a bonfire of the Quangos because although they're supposed to be, um, uh, you know, autonomous and non-government, yeah. they are almost all politically loaded of course. by outgoing governments yeah. who want to retain power. Mm. So an outgoing government knows when it's going out, it appoints all these ridiculous boards... Mm and gives people £300,000 a year to be head of well, it and all it, that. is it not also a place to yeah. park your mates who might otherwise have uh, lost absolutely. their jobs? I absolutely. mean, like, for example, if you're a police chief yeah. Yeah. who's lost their job for some purpose or other, That's it right. wouldn't be at all surprising to find that you've been yeah. appointed to a £300,000 no. a year job. Absolutely. You know, looking, overlooking the police. Yeah. Anyway, so a report today from one of my political journals says this. 58 quangos uh, still have bosses who earn more than the Prime Minister. 
The number of Kwango bosses enjoying bigger salaries than the Prime Minister has soared by more than a third in a year. Official figures that were sneaked out yesterday show 58 chief executives of public bodies earn more than £150,000, mm. right? And, and these are ridiculous things like the National Savings and Investments Authority, yeah. which is supposed to advise people where to put their money. Well, well, don't put it anywhere. Put it under the mattress, right? Yeah. Uh, the Nuclear Decommissioning Authority, which spends its time mm. looking into the possibilities of decommissioning nuclear weapons. Right. Oh, great. Uh, the Science Museum, right. £265,000 the boss there gets, mm. and that is to investigate the potential of scientific uh, artefacts right. from the Science Museum. Well, I don't mind the Science Museum, because at least that actually provides some service to the world. I mean, if you go to the Science Museum in London, it's one of the best science museums uh, you know, around. Yeah, but this is, a, this is an authority which is designed to advise the Science Museum. Do you see what I mean? Oh, so this is not the guy that yeah. runs the Science no, no, Museum? No, 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 not well, at all. ridiculous. Not at all. I mean, it, it's, it's quite ridiculous, some of the organisations that have been set up, which do nothing at all. And as you quite rightly say, it's just in the remit of outgoing politicians to give their mates jobs mm. in the public purse. Right. It's ludicrous. It is ludicrous. And they should all be scrapped tomorrow. But the trouble is, if you scrap them then, you've got, like, so many people moaning against the Prime Minister that you're building another body of opposition to the official well, opposition. Well, I mean, let's take, for example, the nuclear... Yeah. What is it? The nuclear decommissioning yeah, uh, authority. body authority, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, what possible... Um, a sort of influence could they have on a government decommissioning nuclear weapons? No, no. Other than to write a report every year. Yeah, the same. And say, we think we should do we this. We think we should do this. Yeah. Which no, is the same throws, one we wrote last year. Throws it in the bin. That's yeah. right. I mean, it drives me mad. Mm. The waste of public money in this country drives me absolutely mad. And talking about waste of public money, by yes. the way, you know that um, we're building more and more of these blinking uh, wind turbines. I thought that wasn't happening anymore. Well, I thought I, they decided to put a stop to that. I hope it's not, but you know what it's like. The people who support it will find a way around it. But the reason I mention this is because it has now been officially confirmed that birds of prey, yeah. and I'm talking about, you know, these wonderful creatures like carriers and falcons and yeah. sparrowhawks. Kestrels. Kestrels, mm. absolutely right. Now face a very serious risk of crashing into offshore wind turbines mm. as they migrate over water because they can't actually see them. Right. They don't have um, peripheral vision right. like human beings do, and they, they, they fly straight into them. Do they not have a sense that, that they can hear them, though? And do, do they not disturb the sort of general well, atmosphere so it, they can it, work out that they're there? It says here, unlike seabirds, which have now been sort of instinctively trained to avoid marine wind farms, the raptors appear to be attracted to the structures by the island effect, i.e. somewhere to land if they're tired when they're flying over water. You see what I mean? Right. It may be because they're reluctant to cross the open seas and look for help with navigating. Uh, the sweep of the turbine blades, which can reach as high as 722 feet, right. I mean, that is um, absolutely ridiculous, tends to overlap with the altitudes at which most raptors fly over water. Mm. Now, this has come from a research paper in Denmark led by Henrik Skof. Henrik Skof? Yeah. Know him well. And he's from Aarhus University. And he set up two... Uh, Aarhus. Yeah, Aarhus. Aarhus. He set up two bird-finding radars and a laser rangefinder on a narrow strait in the Baltic Sea, facing the north coast of Germany. And during the autumn migration, he found that one of the radars next to the Nisted Wind Farm, the largest in the world, right? Yeah. Um, showed the uh, kites, sparrowhawks, harriers, buzzards and falcons flying into... The uh, wind turbines. Yeah, you would think that, considering that the wind turbines are being uh, erected yeah. as a result of the environmental pressure that's been put on by environmentalists, that they yeah. might have taken into some account yeah. the fact that it could be killing wildlife. <laughs> exactly, but they don't. Yeah, that's yeah. unfortunate. Yeah, I, I, it's an utter disgrace. Mm. Distresses me greatly. Yeah, Does that it... these people are going around doing this and ruining the world. Yeah. Mm. Now somebody has uh, tweeted. Uh, I think it's Steve actually has tweeted a picture of a packet of golden Grahams. Uh, which are, of course, a breakfast cereal in America. Oh, right. I think you can get them here. Yeah. And he's put with it, hmm, very suspicious. I don't know what he means. Mm. Why would he think that would be suspicious? What's the picture behind the Golden Graham uh, words? Oh, well, there's no particular picture. It's a picture of some... Uh, of, Golden Graham. Of some, of some uh, cereal. What, are they like um, uh, shredded wheat? They're they not, stuff? not quite as nice as shredded wheat. I right. mean, I don't eat them. They're a bit, yeah. too, uh, they're a bit yeah. too sweet for me. Yes. They're a bit like sort of um, almost sort of Ritz cracker type size. Yes. Not as thick as shredded wheat. Yes. But very, 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 very sweet. Sweet. And do you eat them with milk? Uh, yeah, oh, well, they're see. cereal, I breakfast see. cereal. Right, now there's a message here. It says, Pork, is the boot of the murk full of tins of sweets like previous years? Mm. And will you be handing out stale cans of beer to the homeless like you've done before? Uh, well, the answer to both is yes and yes. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, have you got more stale beer? 
Uh, well, I will have. I always clear out the beer about this time of year yeah. because when people come and visit in the new year, I like mm. them to have fresh beer. Well, how long do you keep the beer for? Uh, usually about... Well, I, always, I, I, I restock every, like, December yeah. for the new year. Uh, okay. And I think beer lasts about six months. I think so it lasts longer than that, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it does. It's not really stale, to no. be honest. I mean, it's not, it's not dangerous. I mean, you have to have it for about 20 years for it to be stale. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And this is why I get such unfair press on this thing. I give away... Uh, well, to be fair, I think you did drinks. refer to it as st- stale beer. Well, not really. I mean, you know, I give it away because I have a heart of gold and people accuse me of trying to... You know, um, uh, disrespect the homeless bums who sit around <laughs> begging drink, you like know? The filthy beggars. Yeah, that's right, yeah. What about yeah. Uh, your own taste over the Christmas period? Will you be partaking of anything which you otherwise wouldn't drink? I mean, somebody was going to ask this question, yeah. I think, and ask Porky. Is there something that you don't drink the rest of the year that you might have a glass of over Christmas? I love that... Like a glass uh, of port or something. No, I tell you what I love. I love that stuff that you pour over ice and it's cream-coloured and it's like a brandy Neapolitan. What's it called? I don't um, know nothing about Baileys, are you? Baileys, yeah, I love a Baileys. Baileys. I love a Baileys. Well, that's a coffee thing, isn't uh, it? Yeah, yeah, coffee I like a Baileys. Liqueur. I like a Baileys. You like it on ice, do you? Yeah, and also... It's very easy to drink that stuff. I you think, can do a bottle without even thinking. I think you could. I think you could, no, you definitely. can. You can, yeah. I mean, you can. You can, yeah, you could. yeah. It's like drinking ice cream, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Um, and also, with every one you pour, it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah, that's right, yeah. But I think you remember when I visited Stephen your... Tory, by the way. Yeah, don't worry about the time. I visited your abode yes. earlier this year. Yeah. And we did get through a bottle of the old uh, Southern Comfort. Uh-huh. And there weren't any sort of desperate side effects to that, so uh, that might be an option as well. Yes. Mm. Yeah, Southern Comfort, like why that. not? Yeah. Why yeah. not, indeed? Yeah. Uh, now, we're almost out of time. Uh, Porky Vision is coming very, very closely uh, to the next uh, section of the show. This is Talk Sport. <laughs> it's coming up to Christmas. And everybody needs an advent calendar. So here's one for you, T Mike style. Ho ho ho! I don't believe that you can put a load of um, vegetables in yeah. a pan, right. even including onions and all that, yeah. add water, yeah. boil it up, and get soup. I yeah, just don't believe can. it. No, Where I do don't believe vegetable it. Vegetable soup comes from. Well, that comes that comes from vegetables. Yes, it does. Yeah. But but the the liquid that surrounds the yeah. vegetables mm. in a can of Heinz vegetable soup yeah. is not water. No, no. Well, no, because it's been cooked in a variety of things. It depends what kind of soup yeah. it is. No, I don't. You I don't, put, I don't believe put, it. You can put stock. In, you can put stock in it. Yeah, you, you can, can put, put stock in it. Yeah, you can. But you just can't, you can't, can't turn water into soup. That's nonsense. You can't turn water into soup. No. Right. Okay. No. Funnily enough, I, I had a bit of a Christmas miracle yesterday. I made turned water into soup. Oh, yeah? Yeah. What was that? I made some vegetable soup. How'd you make it? Tell me the recipe. Uh, I, I started off, actually, uh, technically mm-hmm. speaking, it's not mm-hmm. strictly a vegetarian vegetable soup. Because right. I put some pancetta ham in it first. Right. Then you cut up an onion, put an onion in. Yeah. Put some leek in. Yeah. All right. So this is all it. in a pan? This is all in a, in a big pot. A pot, and you yeah. Sort of fry it and, t- and toss it around for a while. Right. You put in some salt and pepper. Yeah. All right. Uh, to chop up a carrot. Right. Put a carrot in there. Yeah. Uh, you then, uh, as it's getting very hot and it's starting to cook, yes. fry quite well. Yes. Put a little bit of water in it. Add some vegetable stock. Yes. And you can pretty much put in whatever else you want. Water and vegetable stock. Water and vegetable Ooh. stock. And it tastes. If, you, if that was all you had in it, it would taste great. Yeah. Uh, but then I usually add a bit of uh, herbs de Provence. Herbs de Provence. You know, a bit of yeah. a, bay, a bay leaf, perhaps if you have one. Yeah, bay leaf. Um, I put in some uh, some green peas I had lying around. I put some yeah. tomatoes in it as well. Yeah, yeah. And then if you really want to make it very thick, you yeah. can put some lentils in it and make yes. it sort of uh, some barley lentils and make it and make and it nice barley. and thick. It's really good for you. In fact, I may have someone I get home. Yeah, you say that, but mm. I mean, uh, yeah. well, why wouldn't I? Well, it's very, very healthy food. I'm sure you you also tip in a tin of the old Heinz soup, don't you? No. Bet you do. No, of course not. Why Bet would you, you do, do that? Well, I, d- I don't see how it can be soup any other way. What, you mean if it hasn't got Heinz, a Heinz tin of soup in it, it yeah. can't be soup? Yeah, that's what well, I you, think, yeah. well, How do you think they make the soup that goes in the Heinz tin? Well, they make it in industrial quantities, don't well, they? Well, they, but they can't, they mm. can't go from the start, well, we can't make well, this because we haven't got any other cans of Heinz soup. Well, yeah, I'm you not don't, sure. No, you do not use Heinz soup. I'll tell you why not, because it's got too much sugar in it. And it's got too much salt in it, and you yeah. don't need it. Yeah, when well, you say that, but uh, I don't know. It's true. Daniel says this. Yeah. So MG thinks you should put your money under a mattress. Porky, tell him what's wrong with that. Well, well the reason I said that was mm. not actually to be serious.
serious. It was to say that you might as mm. well put it there for the amount of returns you would get yes. by putting it into a savings account yes. where you get the square. I mean, I get notes occasionally from my bank saying, you have made uh, 0.01 pence mm-hmm. this year. Yeah, I do. 0.07 well, pence. Yeah. yeah, and you just go, well, what, what, you've yeah, wasted, what's the point of that you've then? You've actually wasted money actually yeah, telling no, me that. totally agree. You know, totally agree. Complete waste of time. Totally agree. Now, a couple of stories on the back pages I haven't had a chance to talk to you about. Okay. Uh, back of the mirror, it says, have a heart. England star poised for a return home to the Premier League yes. with Liverpool the number one choice. Uh-huh. Now, that wouldn't be a bad move for Liverpool, would it? Um, to get Joe Hart. They, they, I, I think it'd be a brilliant move for them. They're not overburdened with, with good goalkeepers, are they? I think he's still a very good goalkeeper. I mean, uh, most England managers still believe him to be England's number one, don't they? They do. So uh, I would say it'd be a, a good move for whichever club uh, managed to acquire him. OK. There was some talk about him going to Everton anyway. Was there? Yeah. Yeah, well, Everton's got quite a good goalkeeper, mm. haven't they? Uh, well, Stecklenburg. He, he, Apart from that weird thing, time when he came out when he shouldn't have done. He makes he makes the odd blunder, I have to say, yeah. and even an odd blunder is a blunder too many. They all do, though, don't they? Yeah, I they mean, do. It's yeah. a bit unfair yeah. to to to, to criticise them. Now, what yes. about this on the back of the Sun? PSG in Wenger move. Uh, that Paris Saint Germain are trying to make another move for Arsene Wenger. Yes, you believe that. Uh, I believe would anything you believe about. It will, I mean, would you believe it will happen though? Finally, I think that story's planted by somebody who wants to make sure that it's widely known that Arsenal Wenger is still greatly in demand around the world as a coach. Oh, what, you mean so that Arsenal will suddenly turn around and go, oh, we better safeguard him yet again? Uh, safeguard him or not respond to, you know, yet more pressure from the fans mm. to say, oh, you know, our Premier League challenge is slipping away, don't worry about it. Because that's when those stories seem to appear. Whenever it sort of turns for Arsenal from, you know, great optimism to a kind of here-we-go-again type um, uh Period. Yeah. The stories about Arsenal Wenger being in demand all over the world always seem to crop up. Yeah. Yeah. Now, here's one from Becky who sent this in a bit earlier saying, My sister and I have exchanged the same Christmas cards for the last 20 years. Oh, yes. Why well, bother buying new ones every year? Well, that's a bit strange, isn't it? It's, it's incredibly strange. I've seen this before where people say, Oh, you know, I send him the card this year, he sends it me back next year. What a stupid way to go about. If you're sending a Christmas card, send a Christmas card. Don't. But also, how do you go about getting it back? Well, well, you put it in another envelope and send it back to them, don't you, obviously? You oh, know? you mean they send them backwards yes, and forwards that yes, way? Yes, yes, absolutely. Oh, but then, but then like, how do they write in them, then? Well, I don't know. You know, I think it's just a ritual, isn't it? You know, mm. oh, you know, I'll send you the card, you send it back to me. Oh, I see. You think that you send the card one year, yeah. and then and round then, about oh, January, somebody sends it back and say, here, oh, mate, you've got it back, yeah, mate, or, send it me next or, year. Or the next time you're round the house, they go, oh, by the way, here's your Christmas card, yes. and you can send the same card. Yes. Because otherwise it would get confusing, wouldn't it? It'd get very confusing indeed. Mm. Um, now then, I'll tell you what I was going to tell you about. What were you going to tell me about? Um, you know old Goldfinger? Goldfinger the movie? No, or the, or the, no. Or the, the actual guy? No, the inquest into the man called Goldfinger. Oh, sorry, yes. John Palmer. Oh, yes, yes, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> yeah, only 16,000 suspects. 16,000? Yeah. Well, yeah. how about the fact that at the time... Uh, the police thought that it was uh, uh, it, 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 it died of, of natural causes. Yeah. It now turns out by the inquest report that he was shot six, six times, times. Right, <laughs> by an assassin. It was incredible. I mean, either these people are completely and utterly incompetent yeah. or I smell a bit of a rat. The cops turn up at the barbecue and mm. John Palmer's lying on the ground. Yeah. And the initial diagnosis is, oh, he's had a heart attack. Yes. <laughs> Discovered he's been shot, as he's you been say, peppered. six times. Yeah. Six times. At relatively close range as and well. The, they then find a hole in the fence of yeah. his house where right. the uh, the assassin yeah. had been spying on him for the previous two hours mm. to gauge yeah. his movement so right. he could shoot him properly. Right. And then walked up to him, blew him away. Mm. And then, as you quite rightly say, yeah. the, the cops thought he'd fainted. How, I mean, how is that possible? I've no idea. I mean, if you made that kind of mistake in any other yeah. job, yeah. you wouldn't have a job. No, it, it, it's absolutely unbelievable. When I read it, I thought... <laughs> and now they say, well, it's going to be very difficult difficult to um to yeah i'll read you a bit of the report here yeah, the police on. are no closer to solving the murder of notorious criminal john goldfinger because any one of the sixteen thousand victims of a financial fraud mm. would have had a possible motive and well, isn't, that just, isn't that just a bit of a cop out though if you don't pardon the uh, yeah. expression and, and by the way it's not as if he was shot from long range no, so nobody could say it says walks it. right up to him oh yeah it says palmer 65 was shot six times at close range in his garden in south wheel essex uh, in June uh, last year, yeah. so that's like 18 months ago, right. in a murder that the police said had all the hallmarks of a contract killing. <laughs> that's what they're saying now. They're geniuses, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. He was described as Britain's richest criminal, thought to have been worth £300 million. Yes. Essex police originally believed he'd died of natural causes. Uh, well, he died of natural causes after he was shot six times. Yeah. 
But, you know, uh, that's because, what the natural cause was. But because of recent keel surgery to his chest, two officers later had management action taken against them for their verdict on his death. Right, well, quite right, too. Yeah. But what was the what was the action taken? Uh, well, uh, they were sent on a management course to be able to recognise a dead body <laughs> that had been killed by six bullets and not uh, not a heart attack. I mean, shouldn't they have already known that? Yeah, they thought so. Mm. A post-mortem examination conducted at Palsenden Hospital a week after he was found fa- uh, in his garden found that Palmer had been shot and ballistic experts concluded the weapon used was a pistol yeah. fitted with a silencer, uh-huh. which has never been found. I mean, this really is contract killing oh, stuff, sure isn't is, it? Yeah. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Walking up to a guy with a gun with a silencer on it and going... Mm. Bop, yeah. Six times. Yeah. Detective Chief Inspector Stephen Jennings had told the inquest there were failings on behalf of the Essex Police. Yeah, I think so. Really? Yeah, if you can't recognise a body being pumped full of six bullets. Yeah. He said that more than 700 lines of inquiry had been conducted, more than 200 witness statements had been taken, and the investigation was continuing. But he said it was complicated because of Palmer's lifestyle and his previous involvement with criminality and a large number of people who could have wanted him dead. Palmer was sentenced to eight years in prison in 2001 for a £33 million timeshare fraud that had 16,000 potential victims. Mr Jennings described them as uh, described that as 16,000 motives. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, they're not having a good week in Essex Police Department, are they? Because no. there's a story this morning on one of the other front pages where uh, it says that Michael Barrymore was going to sue the police for two and a half million quid. Yeah, but the, uh, police, for... the police said he deserves one pound. Well, there's the same police that said that uh, that your man Goldfinger yeah. died of natural That's causes. Right, yeah. so, I mean, it's not really up to them. Not really the up point to them. is, is that uh, you know he was interviewed in 2001. Yeah. They didn't then arrest him for another six years. That's right. Um, and whatever you may think of what Michael Barrymore did or yeah. didn't do, yeah. you know his career was pretty much wasted and put to. Oh, his put life was over. At that his point. life was over at that point. He's never really worked since. The, the, the problem... And it turns out he had nothing to do with it. Well, the the father of the victim, Stuart Lubrick, yes. I think his name was, Lubbock, his name, yeah. has mounted a campaign of vilification against Michael Barrymore ever since because yes, he, he was at Michael Barrymore's home that it took place. Yes. Now, Michael Barrymore's a uh, big mistake, and and I've met Barrymore since then, by the way, um, and uh, I haven't spoken to him about There's this. There's no question incident. that there was a time when Barrymore's life was kind of spinning out of control. But that doesn't make him a murderer, does it? That, that, happened, that happened before this incident. Yeah. He was he was going away to shows. He was turning up in hotels after the show, running up and down corridors, yeah. stark naked. Drinking too drink, much. Drinking massive amounts of booze, as he, he self-confesses to. Taking cocaine, yeah. rubbing it on his teeth before right. shows, all this kind mm. of stuff. He then, he then had a, a, a terrible... Uh, personal moral dilemma about his homosexuality yeah. and this kind of stuff, and mm. that spilt out into his public behaviour and all that kind of stuff. But the main problem was always that when this shocking incident happened at his bungalow house uh, with a swimming pool right in the middle of the, you know, the sort of courtyard and all that kind of stuff, and and the body was found floating, his first reaction was to get out of there, and he ran away. Yeah. Now, th- th- that is a fact of what happened that night. Now, the problem is, it's the interpretation of why did he run away, which has dogged him ever since. That's right. And, and but the police have exonerated him now. Uh, they have. They having, have. Having cast yeah. great aspersions on him at the time. Yes. All I'm saying is, is that it doesn't look great for the police department to be running themselves in such a way, the two very yeah. high-profile cases, mm. that they could have got so wrong. Mm. That seems to me to be the problem. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you there. Now, coming up right uh, next, yes. it's time for Porky Vision. Oh, is it? Good. <laughs> TV reviewer, I can reveal yeah. that there are no plans for a new series. Yeah, no, but it wasn't their previous series. Oh, hang on, wait a minute. It says here there might be a new series. <laughs> What's the problem? This is that music. This is that time. Um, Andrew says this. MG says, coming up next is Porky Vision. Mm. Uh, Porky says, oh, is it good? He hasn't seen the time, by the way. Yes, well, don't worry, don't worry. It's but all prepared, all prepared. Yeah, so now, what have you got for us? Now, listen, uh, have you seen the David Walliams show with uh, new funny sketches in it? Uh, well, I've seen it. Uh, you and I spoke about it. In fact, we had Kevin O'Sullivan on talking about it. That's right, we? yeah. The death of the sketch show. Yeah, that's right, yeah. I haven't seen it since then. No, I haven't seen it, but it's, it's rubbish. What do you mean you haven't seen it? Uh, well, I, I can't be bothered to watch it because I've, I've, read, I've spoken to people who have seen it and it's rubbish, so I'm no. not watching it. Okay. But there's too much of David Williams on television and uh, he's becoming a bore to a lot of people, according to some reports I've read. Is that right? Yeah, and uh, the apparently the, um, the Williams show with the sketches... 
Uh, I read a report in a national newspaper yesterday yeah. saying it's not going to be recommissioned. No. Because the first show had 6 million uh, viewers mm. and it's now down to 2.3 oh, million. Dear. And, and, it's, and it hasn't, uh, it's not been a, a critical success. It's not been, it? a, not been a critical success. Yeah. Uh, also, he was apparently, he was in the um, Royal Variety performance. He was supposed to be presenting it. Right. But then, amazingly, when there was a feature on the Calendar Girls, you know, these are the people who raise money by mm. making a calendar of themselves in, yes. in sort of provocative poses. He turned up in that sketch and... Uh, and sort of imitated one of them with a very corny idea of putting iced buns where his chest is, oh, yes. you know what I mean, and yes. that kind of stuff. Mm. And apparently that was uh, that was greeted with, you know, disdain. Um, Did he not also do recently a picture, a reenactment of that Orlando Bloom on a canoe uh, uh, picture? Yeah, he did uh, that with Alan Carr. You know the one where he yeah, had that's his, right, uh, kneeling there, naked. naked yes. He seems to it seems like a bit of nakedness. Uh, does David Williams? Uh, and then he was on a uh, documentary to mark the Diamond Jubilee of the Duke of Edinburgh Awards, uh, and he told a story in it that um, the uh, Duke of Edinburgh had asked who is the nut who swam the uh, you know down that river to raise money for charity, and apparently everybody said he turned the whole thing about you know the Duke of Edinburgh Awards into mm. a thing about him, right? Um, and that he, he 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 loves himself a lot, and uh, apparently also. Um, the yeah, there is a report that his show on the um, the uh, sketch show yeah. is about to be axed. Uh -huh. uh, a quote from an unnamed source: "We won't be making a decision on more Williams and Friend until this series is aired in full." Was the BBC's prim response, uh -huh. but insiders say there's no chance of a second edition. In a skit called "Carry On Up the Sexual Harassment." Uh, tribunal. Carry on up the sexual harassment yeah, tribunal. Yeah, 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 yeah. That <laughs> sounds uh, quite funny, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> except it's not funny, apparently, isn't it? Williams plays caretaker Mr. Balcock, B A W -L, L C O C K. Balcock, yeah. Balcock, yeah. Hmm. Um, while Sheridan Smith is the tea lady. Right. This is in this uh, sketch thing, but apparently it's not working. Do you think there was tea in the teapot? Uh, I'm not sure if there was tea in the teapot. Hmm. Uh, so, anyway. Apparently, the BBC thinks he's the funniest man on television, so he gets lots of shows to do. Uh, but some people are saying that um, they wonder whether, uh, having made his name in Little Britain, right? Yes. It was Little Britain, wasn't it? It was Little Britain. Yeah, that uh, maybe the smaller uh, chap, Matt Lucas, was in fact the the real comedy talent right. uh, within that duo. Well, and, certainly and not David Williams. Williams has certainly become much more successful. Sorry, he ended up he, he ended up on uh, Britain's Got Talent as a judge, didn't he? I mean, he's become Who's much that? more Williams. Yeah, Williams. Oh, yes. yeah, Williams. That's I'm right. I'm saying yeah. he's much more yeah. successful than Matt Lucas. Uh, you know, well, in, in general, since Little Britain was a success. Matt Lucas had a personal tragedy in his life. You know, his partner yeah. um, suffered an um, illness and That's died. Right. Yeah, and. I've actually met uh, Matt a couple of times, actually. Yeah. He's a big Arsenal fan. Is he? And when I've been at Arsenal, he's uh, he's come into uh, the box. He's a very, very charming man yeah. and a uh, really nice guy. Yeah. And uh, But I think, uh, he, he's never told me this personally, but I think he took a break from sort of public mm. work right. because he, he was, yeah. you know... He, he, uh, he, and that he, might be you know, the, the reason. tragedy in his private life. But all I'm saying yeah. is Williams has been yeah. all over the place for a long time. Oh, he has, yeah. And, I mean, a lot of people love yeah. his, his children's books. I mean, my kids love his books, for example. Oh, really? The he reason, writes, do He writes they? children's books. So okay. they're, they're very popular, yeah. OK. Now, uh, today I watched Carry On Up the Camel. Carry On Up the Camel. <laughs> Not Carry On Up the Camel, I'm sorry. Wasn't it called no, Follow the Camel? Follow the, carry On, Follow the Camel. Not Carry On... Was well, he sure it was just Follow the Camel? Follow, no, I think... No, it was definitely a Carry On film. Though. Yeah, but I think it was just called Follow the Camel. I mean, those actors in those Carry On films, they're brilliant. Now, old... What's his name was in it? You know, Phil Silvers from... Uh, from Bilko. From Bilko. Yeah. And do you know that uh, Phil Silvers spent the last ten years of his life literally in a locked room, Did a he? locked and darkened room, yeah. watching reruns of every episode of Sergeant Bilko. Well, of his own show. Yeah, that's all he did, day well, in, day out. he become a bit of a narcissist, well, well, he got up in the morning mm. and, you know, he had, a, like, an assistant or something and right. uh, had his breakfast and he locked himself in the dark room and he watched Sergeant Bilko programmes all day Dear me. until 11 o'clock at night and then mm. he went to bed and then he got up the next day and then he went into the locked room and watched um, <laughs> uh, Sergeant Bilko but all day. how was it that he ended up in a carry-on film? Because well, you never, never see really anybody who's not British he was, he in was a carry-on film. Well, he was brilliant in it and, uh, you know, he was the, the uh, you know, the sort of Jack the Lad type... Because uh, this, this uh, film... Carry on, uh, follow that camel. Up the camel. 
uh, carry on follow the camel. It was it was a skit on on beau geste, you see. Oh, was it? Right. So these guys are all wearing the epées, you know, which is the French foreign legion. Foreign legion, hat, yes. And, and staggering around the desert, you know, all collapsing from. And where did this fit in the carry on sort of cycle? Was it towards the end? I think it's towards the end. But right. all the carry on people were in it. I mean, that Charles Hawtrey, so funny. Charles Hawtrey, yeah. And Kenneth Williams. Kenneth Williams, so funny. What Sid a, James. What, what a funny man. No, Sid James wasn't in it. So no. probably after he died then. It would be after he died, yeah. And they, all, the, all the plot is that they all wander around the desert, you know, and, and sort of get lost and die of thirst and, and keep seeing uh, <laughs> oasises, which don't exist, you know, right. because they're all, like, deranged. Yeah. You know, uh, mirages. Yeah, mirages yeah. and all that kind of stuff, you right. know. So did you watch the whole movie, then? I watched about an hour of it, really, because right. I, 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 I was having a bit of mental turmoil today because right. I was uh, once again engaged in enormous amounts of paperwork mm. relating to expenditure no. and finance. It's the end of the year, yes. and you have to prepare all sorts of accounts yes. for all sorts of people. Um, to... Yeah, I paid a tax bill today. Yeah, which is well, very painful. It, uh, please, don't even talk. It's so painful. VAT, returns and considerations, yeah. mm. um, uh, tax affairs and, and various different guises. We shouldn't really leave Property... it to the last. Remuneration. Year, though, we? Well, that's the only time the accounts want to deal with it. Mm. They don't want to deal with it in like August, or, yeah. or, or, or they always want to deal with it in this month. Yeah. So I was going slightly mad this yeah. afternoon when mm. I thought I need uh, I need some junk yes. television. Yes. So I watched uh, to take your mind off. Yeah. It. Carry on, follow that camel, which yeah. was very therapeutic indeed, mm. and uh, it was great watching these guys um, staggering around, you know, doing nothing. Now, what I should have watched last night, which I'm going to watch probably tomorrow. Mm is the third episode of In Plain Sight. Oh, yes. And this is, uh, it's, it's thrilling, but shocking. It's, a, it's a, a nutter in Scotland who goes around murdering people. Um, he sexually assaulted a person, a woman, got nine years and is came it, is out. Is it better than that one that we saw? What was the one that we saw that we decided was quite ridiculous? You know, over the over the sort of earlier part of this year. What was that? There was the murder of the guy that drove up in his car and. Oh you know. no, that was brilliant. You liked that? That was brilliant. One of us. One of us. That I was called one of us. I thought you didn't like it. No, it's brilliant. Oh, I right. loved that because, and the reason it was called one of us is because the eventually the main villain was put in the barn in a remote Scottish village. Right. And when they all went back next morning because they locked him in the dog cage, right. he'd been bludgeoned to death. And the you know the the head of the but community, the, but it was the ludicrousness of it, wasn't it? Where they came, where yeah. the car had crashed, yeah, and then they right. covered it with tarpaulin. And the that's cops right. turned up and, and didn't realise what this big lump was in the middle of the field. And and then they they buried the car, and then the cops realised it was a car, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But anyway, um, what did I say? This uh, thing in Scotland, in plain called? sight, right? In plain sight. So the guy goes to jail for a sexual offence, comes yeah. out. Nine years later, and then takes his revenge on society by right. going around molesting women and actually right. killing some of them. Right. And this is not based on a true story. Based on a true story. Mm. And the lead actor is a very well known Scottish actor with a moustache who was in Shetland. Remember Shetland? Well, I remember Shetland. I only Shetland watched one brilliant. episode. Of oh, that. Shetland was brilliant. You but should I, get the box I, I set. I thought it was all a bit dark. No, no, it was great. It really? was great. And really? So is that a recommendation? Oh, without Shetland. Shetland. Oh, uh, honestly. Because there's still time for me to get another well, Christmas present. Well, yeah, well, get Shetland because the basic plot is mm. is that a. They've got a notorious criminal in jail in Glasgow, right. and they're going to try him. Yeah. And the main witness mm. is one of his former henchmen, right. and they, the henchman has to go under witness protection, so they send him to the Shetlands. Right. I mean, ridiculous, because yeah. the best way to hide a, a, a witness is to send him to London, yes. where there are millions of people. Or hide no. them in plain sight, uh, in fact, uh, in which plain... brings us back to the yeah, other yeah. one. See, I did so, that. So, but anyway, they send him to Shetland. Mm. So as soon as a stranger arrives in the Shetlands, everybody starts talking about him. And so they, they, so the, the arch criminal inside jail yeah, exactly. sends... Yeah, absolutely right. It's a send, stupid idea. Sends a hitman to the Shetlands right. to kill him. And they do kill him. So then they've got to find out who's murdered him mm. and all this kind of stuff, right. you know, uh, because no other stranger was found on the island. So right. they reckon that what they did is recruited a local in the Shetlands by giving him so much money to shoot the guy mm. so that they wouldn't discover who'd killed him. Mm. See what I mean? Yeah. And, and all, but anyway, getting back to in plain sight, yes. this guy is a vicious, nasty, but mentally tormenting mm. criminal right. who, whenever he goes to court, conducts his own defence and, and, and terrifies the witnesses in the box by giving them the evil stare. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the witness in the box crumbles. And are they and, all frightened of him in the prison as well and all that? Well, no, that was a very good scene in it, actually, mm. in the second episode yeah. where he goes into jail... And he thinks he's Jack the Lad because right. he's a notorious criminal. Mm. And the, his case is being discussed on the television and his face comes up on the screen. Yeah. And he starts saying to all these really hardened Scottish criminals, you know, eh, 
You guys are nowhere. You guys are nowhere. You ever get your face on the telly like that? Do you ever get your face on the telly like that? And um, and he sits down mm. at the wrong seat on the wrong table in the refectory in the prison. Yeah. And some really hard Scottish guy says, hey, you, and calls him a really nasty name, yeah. you know. Get out of my meat seat, you know. Right. He says, <laughs> you don't understand who I am, do you? You don't talk to me like that. You know who's king round here? And the Scottish criminal just raises his left fist and bludgeons his face with right. one blow, knocks uh-huh. him off the seat onto the floor. Right. Now, I haven't yet seen the last episode, mm. right, because so I'll be reporting on that revenge, next week. Presumably. Well, apart from going around killing a lot of women, which is what he does, yeah. I am certain that a twist of the plot will be he'll be waiting for when that criminal comes out mm. and I reckon he'll do him, yes. you know, with a knife or something like yeah. that and says... Do you remember me, son? Yeah. You know, mm. you raised your fist to me in yes. prison. Do you know what happens to people when they raise their fist to yeah. me? And then he'll try to mm. dismember his He's testicles a man from your his own body. Heart. You like no. a bit of a revenge, no, no, best no, served cold, no. don't you? No, I'm not into revenge at I all. Do? Okay. But I do recommend Carry On, Follow That Camel. Okay. Brilliant film. <laughs> and if you're feeling down and out and despairing over Christmas, go or and find it. Or you've got a big it. tax bill. Go, yeah, yeah, that's right. You go and find it somewhere and watch it. It's great, right. honestly. Okay. Good therapy. Okay. Therapeutic. That was Porky Vision. Yes. And uh, this is The Two Mics. It's coming up to Christmas, and everybody needs an advent calendar. So here's one for you, T-Mike style. Ho, ho, ho! Why do you keep saying werewolf? Because that's how I pronounce werewolf. Well, it's not werewolf. It is werewolf. It's werewolf. It's not. Michael Jackson's video was werewolf. No, it's not W-E-I-R, it's W-E-R-E. Yes, I know, that's werewolf. Now, one of the things I thought you might have mentioned in your yeah. Porky Vision section there yes. uh, was the uh, sad death. Here we are in 2016, where yeah. there's supposed to have been so you know more celebrities dying. Than yeah, else. yeah, yeah. Um, an actor called Deddy Davis died yesterday at the age of 78. Now, you might not remember her, but she was in the Railway Children. Right? I've never seen it. You never seen the Railway Children? No. And by the way, who's the TV review around here? Me or you? Um, well, it's you me. are. You it's are. Me, yeah. But I mean, so do you, you think I need reminding about some actress I've, that I've never seen? Well, I think you should know um, that I she can't was go recently. Around... Yeah. She was recently in the, in the comedy series Stella, right? Which you will know, obviously, from your time as a TV reviewer. No, I don't. Are you telling me seriously? You never saw the Railway Children? No, never. Which is a movie, by the way, not a television show. I know. It's a Jenny Agatha. Jenny Agatha. Yeah. yeah. No, I never saw it. Nineteen seventy. No, no. I thought she was I born. Thought, yeah. Well, I just think we should give this girl, um, this woman. Yeah. Um, a, a bit of a, a bit of an obituary. She was born Gillian Davis in Bridge End, South yeah. Wales. She's never appeared on my radar. Her long career in TV also included roles in Doctors, The yeah. Bill, yeah. The Foresight Saga, yeah. and Some Mothers Do Have Them. Yeah, nobody cares. I'm sorry to what say that. What do you mean nobody cares? No, no, no. Died, see, now but... you've overstepped a mark. Well, that's it, unreal to say nobody well, cares. Yeah. She's she's just died. She's and, not uh, very well known. That's all. She, and well, I, she's I'm, quite I'm well known. I'm very sympathetic to somebody who's died, and their uh-huh. family will be distressed and all that. Yeah. But you're trying well, to you tell just me said I nobody sh- cares. No, but you're criticising my professional no, I'm not. work, my no, TV no, review, no. right? You see, being takes hours and hours of preparation. I'm not suddenly. You're being oversensitive. I'm not suddenly going to. Oh, I've spotted a paragraph on tomorrow morning's newspapers, and suddenly, you know, shoehorn it into my crafted well, TV that's review. That's exactly I'm not going to do, do that, you see, right? This is why you have no capacity for running anything, right? Because what I didn't do was jump in on you and say, by the way, shouldn't you have put this into your pool? No, uh, no, I shouldn't. no, I should Because if I we had no brains at all or editing capability, that's what I would have done. No. Instead, I waited until we were finished, no. and then I said in a very friendly way, by the way, let's mm-hmm. give this woman a mention. To which you replied, nobody cares. Mm. Absolutely shocking. Mm. Shocking behaviour. Now, I've got something else for you, if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, have you seen the tale of two very different Christmas trees? Inside uh, one of the papers this morning, uh, there's a council Ooh. up in uh, Heighton, I think it is. Heighton, Liverpool. Um, uh, Merseyside, yeah, yeah. Uh, where they've got a tree decorated by locals mm-hmm. after the local Labour run council insisted they couldn't afford to put up decorations or lights. Oh, really? Because of cuts in their budget, right? Yeah. And yeah. they've spent £15 from mm-hmm. their own pocket on mm-hmm. decorations. There it is. The worst Christmas tree in Britain. How much? Fifteen one five. Fifteen one five. Right. Pathetic. Right now, look at the one uh, on the on the right of the page. Yeah, where's right? that from? Uh, that is from your old friend Mariah Carey's house. Oh right, I've seen that. Yeah, I saw a picture of that. And yeah. uh, inexplicably, well, good for her. Oh, inexplicably, uh, she's wearing some very very scantily. Um, she's wearing like basically a, a, a shawl yes. and a bikini. Yes. Posing in front of her twenty foot Christmas tree. Yeah. Well, which she spent something like um, I don't know hundreds of thousands of pounds on. 
Well, she brings a bit of joy to the world, doesn't she, old Maria? I've been a bit critical of her, but I Mariah. Mean, she's a bit of a, a diva and all that. But where would the world be without those people? By the way, um, I sh- really should have been down at Stonehenge yesterday. Why? For the, for the winter solstice? It, it was the shortest day, wasn't it? The winter solstice. And uh, there were like a load of pagans there. Well, there will be. Yeah. Why would you want to be down? You're not a pagan, eh? Well, I'm not sure what a pagan is. Are you sure what a pagan is? Well, a pagan is somebody who worships, basically, the sun, the moon, all of those things. I thought they worshipped the earth. Well, they do the earth as well, yeah. So, well, it's, it's, you know, it's anything other than what you might regard as God. Yeah, but they're not devil worshippers, are they? No. You sure? That's Satanists. Yeah, that's right. So they're not dangerous, then, these pagans, no, are they? No, because they're not dangerous. You sure? No. They're weird, though, aren't they? No. They are. Well, they... Then why are they any more weird than people who believe in God? Well, because they live in these yurts, don't they? In, like, remote fields Nothing in Wales. Nothing wrong with a yurt. You know. Um... Some of them do. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of pagans who live in, uh, you know, normal housing. No, yeah, You don't, don't have so. to live in a yurt to be a pagan. No, most pagans either live in... You know, houses made of uh, birch trees, uh, birch wood or Are something. Are you thinking of wattle and daub? No, not wattle and daub, but, I mean, they do actually, you know, teppies. They live in teppies. That's not true. That's right, they do. They That's do. not true. A lot of pagans live How in teppies. How many pagans do you know? I don't know any tep- uh, pagans. Right, so you don't know actually where they live. You're just living on a sort of a general, um, particular no. generalisation. No, I, I've seen a documentary on a load of pagans in Wales. They live in teppies and they farm the land... Right, uh-huh. they've got like their own shire horse and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> well, they have. Why would they have their own shire horse? I don't know, but they have, and they and they 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 prefer to plough fields with shire horses uh-huh. rather than like tractors and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you but know there's what I mean? Dangerous about being a pagan. Well, and I, some I, think argue, is, can, I think there is. I think there is. You can easily argue the case that yeah. they actually believe in things which you can see, as opposed to believing in something you can't see. Yes. Hey? What do you mean by that? Well, you can't see God, can you? Yeah, but you can't. Well, they believe there's a sun god, don't they? They believe the sun and the earth and and the and the yeah. sort of the general kind of um, movements of the earth, the seasons of the earth, yeah. the moon yeah. Yeah. are things worth worshiping because they believe that they get life from those things. I mean, which I, is much more easy to prove than God is. To be honest, that's not a bad way of thinking. I don't it's think all it is. There, it's all there to look at. The only problem is that I I don't want to be I don't want to subscribe to being a pagan mm. because. Well, most pagans are nutters. Well, you're saying that without yeah. having met any of them. No, they are, but I mean, they have... You watched a documentary once. No, no, no. They have very strange lifestyles, pagans. Why? If Look, if it was normal, yeah. how come, you know, when you drive around, you see, you know, the you know the sacred church of St Mary, yeah. and you see the, um, the Baptist church, yeah. and you see the church of the uh, Redeemer of Christ... Church of the Poisoned Mind... No, 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 that's idiot, that's uh, Boy George. <laughs> How come you don't see the pagan chapel? Because they don't have chapels. Well, well uh, they have to go somewhere to... Yeah, uh, they, they worship generally in the open air because in their, be- in their belief system... OK, why, you did, did, not, why, why you, did you see the pagan field? Well, you don't see the pagan field because you live in a conurbation of London, no. more or less. No, but I, I walk on the North Downs well, and the South you... Downs. I never see any... Pagan well, maybe, maybe you just don't know where they are. I mean, if well, you went, as you say, to Stonehenge mm. to celebrate the winter solstice, which, by the way, yes. marks the beginning of winter, apropos an argument we had a few weeks ago, well, when you said it wasn't actually autumn, it was winter. Yeah, winter but, it is now, yeah. because the winter solstice brings winter on. Yes, but, I mean, that's only technically the, the, the situation. Well, it's the accurate thing. It's technical. I mean, the point is, we all know winter starts in, like, the second week of November, not the second week, of, not the third week of December. We all know that. Uh-huh. We do. We all no, know we that, don't. don't we? No, we don't. We do, because, I mean, you know, you can't call the last week in November, first week in December, autumn anymore. Autumn starts in sort of September, and it goes to no, September, October, and the first two no. weeks of November, and that's it. Why do you think they call it an Indian summer in September if the sun's still shining quite brightly? Well, that's, that's an expression. They don't call it born... Indian autumn, do they? No, but it's, uh, that's born of the fact that we used to rule India... And we used to compare the temperate <laughs> climate there before, with the temperate right? climate if, here. If you if you take the four uh, the four quarters of the year yes. and separate them up into the four seasons, yes. right, yes. you will get winter beginning in December, well, December, uh, January, February. Well, you say that, but I mean, I'm not sure I can subscribe to that really? particular point of view. Are you sure? Yeah, absolutely. Now we've got a lot of people uh, having a go at you for various things. Uh, go on. Uh, Steve says, "I don't believe the railway children had Rogerisation in it, therefore Porky is not interested." Yeah, it could be. Uh, and Dazza says, "Did the plank just call it a crafted TV review? Uh, he should be taken to training standards for that remark." 
Mm -hmm. um, and Adrian says, red card for Porky over the Debbie Jones comment. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. I just don't know who she is. Mm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to pretend that I do. You know, you don't want falsehoods, do you? Uh, certainly don't want falsehoods. But, and Becky says, off yeah. to Stewart Island off the coast of New Zealand for Christmas with my sister and husband. Very remote. Oh, very good. Very nice. I okay. presume she means her sister and her sister's husband. Yeah, I don't exactly. think she's married. No, I think you're right. Uh, by the way, mm. um, talking about people you've never heard of and don't know, yeah. uh, ELO have been admitted into the new Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Have they? What, in America or here? Uh, let me just find out. Let me see. Uh, pr uh, Bromley Jeff Lynn's Electrolyte also known for... Uh, uh, will be given the honorary position in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at a ceremony in New York on April the 7th. Oh, there you go. However, um, somebody else has been admitted who I've never heard of, okay. and I bet you haven't either. Go on, then. A rapper called Tupac Shaka. Tupac? Yeah. Yeah, he's the guy that got gunned down. That's right, he said he was shot in 1996. Yeah. yeah, of course I've heard of him. Well, I've never heard of him. Well, he may, well be, did... he may be the most famous rap star of all time. Oh, not least because he was killed on the streets of New York. Well, I mean, if you're only famous for being shot, you well, might as well... Well, he wasn't just famous for being shot, might but he well became... Be President John F. Kennedy. But he became more famous after he was shot, in mm. a way, because mm. his his uh, music was like a lot of people, you know, who, who were killed prematurely yes. in their work. Yes. His music became sort of more widely available. A lot more people started listening to it. OK. And lots of other artists did songs in tribute to him. Yeah. There were concerts in tribute to him. And Do also, you live in a cupboard? No, no. And also Joan Byers. Have you heard of her? Yes. Yeah. Uh, they paved paradise, put up no. a parking that's lot. That's Joni Mitchell. Ooh. Oh, that's right, yeah. Joan Byers was uh, <laughs> the night they drove old Dixie down. Well, that was the band. She may have sung and that. all the people were singing yeah. the night. No, it's her song. Uh, you sure? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm pretty sure yeah. that was Another, a band song. No, it wasn't. Other people uh, ripped it off. Uh-huh. Uh, she was very good, Joan Byers. Yeah. Probably still is. Probably still alive, is she? Well, I would imagine if she's mm. being admitted to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes. Um, although Tupac's not, so who knows? No, who knows, yeah. I don't think she's dead, though. And the other have, you got, have you got her greatest hits, then? No. But that was a great song, that. It was about the American Civil War, and I'm a, I'm a student of the American Civil War. Are oh, you? Yeah. Now, also, a group called Pearl Jam. Pearl Jam, yeah. Right? Yeah. Have you heard of them? No. No. They're quite good as well. Yeah, American mm. group, apparently. Yes. Yeah, a little bit grungy, I would say. Yeah, yeah, OK, if you say so. I don't know anything about them or Tupac Shakur, but uh, I'm sure that they're very credible musicians and deserve their place in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yes, rock I'm trying roll, to find any reference to Joan Byers and the, day, uh, the, the night they drove old Dixie down. Yeah. I'm not finding it, I'm afraid. Yeah, well, I'm afraid that that's down to your information device. I can tell you that was a terrific uh, record of, uh, yeah. of my youth. Yes, uh, she did, in fact, do a cover version of the band's The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down. Well, there you go. As I told you, it's well, not her only, song. That was the only one that got into the charts, believe me. Well, no, me. it wasn't, because she also did all sorts of versions of things like Blown in the Wind and others. Um, she did Forever you, Young, friend. she did as well. Forever Young. Diamonds and Rust, There But For Fortune. We Shall Overcome was one of her big hits. <laughs> yes, right, OK. But we haven't got any more time to talk about uh, no, the Joe haven't. Byers. No. This is Talk Sport. She has spent £2,500 on gifts for her beloved dog, Prince. Yeah. Uh, OK. Fit for uh, a king. Yeah. When he wakes up on December the 25th, the hairless Chinese crested hound... Hairless Chinese, Chinese crested, crested hound. hound. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. Right. Uh, ...will be unwrapping uh, such goodies as an £800 toy box. That's to put his toys in. Yeah. Right? Right. Uh, a £300 faux mink fur bed. Ridiculous. A £275 personalised tuxedo... Really? Where would you take your dog in a tuxedo? Well, out to dinner, I suppose. If you love the Two Mics podcast, you'll love the live show. Weekday overnights from 1am on DAB Digital Radio and 1089 and 1053 AM and via the TalkSport app. TalkSport, your Premier League station with exclusive commentaries.